Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call this combined meeting of council to order. Is there any disclosure of pecuniary interest and general nature thereof? Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, 7D, which is 576 Milton Street transfer. I'll be declaring a conflict when that matter uh, arrives. Thank you. Could I have a motion to approve the meeting agenda, please? Or Moved by Councillor Reavy, seconded by Councillor Plummer. All those in favor? Carried. Now, those of you who uh, you may have noticed that the combined committee minutes are not attached to uh, this particular document, but it is with our council. Uh, so we'll look after that during our council meeting. Presentation, we have SRB with us today. Mr. LaPierre, do you have a comment, please? Yes, uh, thank you. We're, we're pleased to, uh, to have with us this evening uh, representatives of SRB Technologies which is a uh, prominent local industry to provide a report on their annual company review, uh, to answer any questions that council members may have, and to provide some information on their upcoming license renewal application. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lapier, for the introduction. And if I can have, yeah. My name is uh, Stefan Levesque. I'm the president for SRB Technologies. I'm joined here today with Ross Fitzpatrick. He's the vice president. And today we're the only owners of uh, SRB Technologies. So thank you for taking the time to uh, listen to us today. We've got a small presentation to give you an overview of our facility and our plans for the next few years.
Can everyone on the Zoom see the share screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. Just having some technical difficulties on this end. Good to go? Yeah. yeah? Okay, thank you very much. Um, so first, uh, I'm the owner with Ross Fitzpatrick of SRB Technologies, as I was saying, and we've been in operation in Pembroke, for those who don't know, since 1990. We employ 41 people, and most of which live in Pembroke, I'm happy to say. Um, we lease a facility right here on Boundary Road. You can see the picture on the slide. Um, that's 15,000 square feet, and we share the building with a company called Meneng and a company called Messer Gas or Lindy Gases. Next slide, please. The main product that we make is a tritium light source. We're actually the original developer, the ones who invented the light source. Um, it's basically a capsule that's coated with phosphorescent powder and filled with a low energy radioactive gas called tritium. And the reaction between the phosphorescent powder and the tritium gas makes it glow in the dark. You see there are a number of pictures of different sizes and shapes and colors that we make of these light sources. Next slide, please. Their products are fail safe. They require no maintenance over their useful life. They don't use any electricity, no power, no batteries, and no wiring. So they're self-contained. Next slide, please. What we use these lights for is to, we use them in life safety devices that basically illuminate the way for various purposes. The main one that you'll see is on the slide there, the aircraft uh, exit signs. Next time that you fly, over 85% of the planes contain our exit signs. If they ask you if you're fit enough to sit beside the exit doors and you decide to sit beside it, you'll see that in the door handle, our exit signs are in all of them. And it's a perfect use for them because you can understand if the plane by misfortune loses power or electricity, the signs can still illuminate and you can see them to open the door. They're also used in the bulkhead, bulkheads and various switches. Other applications are you see there a right, uh, flight refueling marker. If you ever watch a military movie and you see a big tanker plane that other fighter jets hook up to it to fuel with gas, our lights are lined up around them. And again, you can understand the application because it generates no spark, there's no power, no electricity. Mixed with fuel, there won't be any issues. We make a number of devices as well for the military that you see there, and about 50,000 exit signs a year. And those are basically made for predominantly for areas where it's hard to get wiring into, like stairwells, mines, sewers, but we also put them in regular buildings. If you, uh, next time you go see a movie in Canada, you'll see that all our exit signs are in that building. Next slide, please. He's no longer a prince, but I uh, thought I'd show the picture. Uh, there's a picture we saw one day in the paper where Prince Harry is actually in the military and wearing one of our products. So they're widely used mainly by the U.S. and British military. Next slide, please. Um, during COVID-19, we uh, were requested by a number of people in the area, the hospital notably, and a number of old age homes, if there was a possibility that we could make face shields for them because there was no availability of face shields from where they were supplying them before, which was Asia. So we undertook a project to develop some tooling, uh, 3D printed some uh, prototypes and uh, made a tooling where we, that we could produce 10,000 face shields a week, which we started supplying to the hospital at that time, donated a number to some uh, non-for-profit organization, Women's Sexual Assault Center, so on and so forth. And uh, now they can be, uh, purchased to Valley Workwear in Pembroke, and uh, so on and so forth. Next uh, slide, please. Our main markets for our main product, we supply to over 200 customers that are, again, distributed in three major market segments. The aerospace industry, like I discussed, construction, and the defense industry. Because the product is radioactive, we have to acquire license from the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission to be able to ship the product outside of Canada, and we're licensed currently to ship to 19 countries. In 2020, we made 827 shipments of this product. 63% of our sales, it's usually roughly about the same every year, are sold outside of Canada, with about 55% being in the United States. Next slide, please. 
although we're a private company, I thought it'd be important for you to see uh, where our sales have been since uh, Mr. Fitzpatrick and I purchased the company in 2012. You see that we had a rapid growth at the facility, uh, achieving the high of just before COVID happened. And then you can see like most other facilities, we had the drop due to COVID. Luckily, unlike certain industries like the restaurant business, we've been, you can call lucky to only lose about 20% of our sales during that period. But now our order book is the biggest it's ever been and we expect to make a strong recovery and get back to where we were before COVID by the end of 2022. Next slide, please. We use a number of suppliers. Uh, we buy about $6 million worth of materials a year. We have 170 suppliers of goods and services and the majority of located in Ontario with over 50 right here in the Valley. Some names you may know, BDI, CNL, and the industrial products, ETM, uh, Lindy, gases, many tooling. So we're trying to buy local as much as we can. On contrary to where you were told, local advantages for us are low taxes. Uh, we also own a facility that does sales and distribution in North Carolina. And we've also explored working out of different communities in Ontario and in Canada. And we found that Pembroke has a great marriage with low taxes, low rental rates for industrial facilities. And because there's been a big downturn in manufacturing over the last 10, 15 years with eddy match closing and so on and so forth, for us in manufacturing, there's a huge available workforce for us of people who have experience in that field. We find that since we started, the employees are very loyal, easily trainable, so we're very happy to be here. And on top, and I'm just not saying this because I'm here today, we've had a lot of support from uh, people like you at the municipal level, provincial and federal level. And there's lots of funding opportunities in this area compared to where they would be in other larger centers. Next slide, please. We believe our strongest asset though, is like I touched on a bit, is our staff. We have a great staff and without that you can't do anything. So we feel that's our best asset. And despite our growth, the workforce that we have, usually when we employ somebody, they're there to stay. Uh, we have an average of 12 and a half years experience, which is people just under 42 years old. The people that handle all the health physics, which is the radiation and the health safety at our facility, have 123 person years working at SRB, about amounting to 15 years on average per person. So those are the ones controlling the safety at our facility. Uh, the president, vice president, Ross and myself, with, since we bought the company uh, in 2012, when risk of dating ourselves. We started very young. Uh, we have 54 years combined experience working at the facility, just over 27 years each. So we were about 10 when we started, if you want to make the math. But no, uh, joking aside, no, we, ha we have 27 years and it's the best move I ever made moving from a large center coming here. Ross is local, but uh, we're very happy to be at the company and that we stayed and eventually purchased it. Uh, since then, we've carefully hired skilled staff poached them from other facilities, uh, other industries, and applied them to basically our company and uh, built a great staff that we have. Next slide, please. We're licensed and regulated by the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission to process tritium. That's the low energy radioactive gas we're talking about. We've recently applied to renew our license for a period of 15 years. The current license that we own expires next June, 2022. So the license process has already started. We applied a couple of months ago. Um, and this license that we currently have is seven years. Over the current license term, the seven years and well before that, and that's why we use 15 years, we've continued to operate the facility safely, worked further lower emissions, improved the effectiveness of our programs, and we have regular interaction with the public like we're doing today. Next slide, please. Another thing that ensures that we do everything right, we have a lot of independent oversight. Like I mentioned, Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission is who regulates us and they inspect us regularly and review our programs. We have a license for our hazardous materials, uh, chemicals from the Ontario Ministry of the Environment. We're registered to ISO 9001 for manufacturing, which is the highest standard. We have somebody that we've hired dedicated 365 days a year to maintaining audits of our facility. 
Usually it's something that you see in large chains like Walmart and McDonald's where they have a regional auditor where they audit 10 facilities or 20 stores. Us, we hired somebody that's on site that has a large range of experience in various departments, got tra training in external uh, and internal audits, and she audits the facility on a continuous basis all year. Um, we also, since we purchased the Tritium from Ontario Power Generation, they also perform audits of our facility, making sure that we use it properly. We have, uh, and thanks to you, uh, annual Pembroke Fire Department inspections. And we also have fire protection uh, inspections from an external consultant that deals strictly with people with uh, background in uh, handling nuclear material. Um, if you see products like fire extinguishers or smoke detectors that have the brand UL on them, that's Underwriter Laboratories. Our products, a lot of them are also UL approved, our exit signs, fire protection. So they also do quarterly audits of our facility to make sure that the products meets the standards. In addition to that, since we make a lot of military products in aerospace, we had a range of customers come in and audit our processes to make sure that we perform them as they expect to make their products properly. If there's any findings that are found, I think you'll find that any reports that you ever see, we answer them very promptly, address them as fast as we can, and sometimes even before they even leave when the audit is done. Next slide, please. Uh, we have a number of key training activities that we conduct, radiation safety training, fire extinguisher training. We train the Pembroke Fire Department in case there was ever an issue at the facility that they know where to go and how to handle it. We do uh, TDG training, transportation of the dangerous good, and health and safety. Next slide, please. As a result of our operations, we have small emissions of the radioactive gas to the air. And if you can see, I've done a small graph there that you can see that um, for the last five years, the annual emissions are less than 8% of our license limit. And now that's quite a significant achievement when you see it's fairly stable out there over those five years because we've increased production over that time. So despite having increased production significantly, we're able to maintain the emissions the same by essentially reducing the emissions per unit that we produce. We also have uh, liquid emissions from the facility. And again, that's a much lower limit of 200 GBQs, they call it. And we're less than 7% of our license limit on that as well. Next slide, please. In addition to measuring at the facility what comes out of our stack, um, we also have a number of areas that we measure to make sure that we protect the environment. We have 40 air monitoring stations, 35 of them within two kilometers of the facility, and you might have seen them. They sit usually on a pole, a tree, or someone's yard that are six to 12 feet in the air, a yellow box. We have eight precipitation monitors. We monitor the Muskrat River. We monitor 36 wells, 29 monitoring, and seven residential or business wells. Local milk, sludge samples, and we also monitor produce sampling from local gardens and local markets. All the data that's used from this monitoring is used to calculate what the dose to a member of the public is. And how we calculate that is by assuming the individual lives close to SRB in Johnston Meadows, right beside us, works right near SRB at Menange during the whole time of the year, eats only vegetables from his garden, only drinks local milk, only drinks well water, then their dose, the maximum that they could get would be what you see on the next slide, please. For 2020.0024, for the limit of one millisievert. So you're actually talking about a lot less than 1%. It's actually a quarter of a percent. So that's assuming worst case scenario. So it's actually very improbable that somebody works at Menange, lives at Johnston Meadows, drinks only milk and vegetables from his garden. The next slide, please. We also have a dose that our staff gets as a result of working at our facility. And I have here the maximum and average for the members of the public that work at our facility. Instead of the limit being one, it's 50, obviously, because they work at the facility. And you can see there that the maximum that somebody's had is less than 2% of the limit for a nuclear energy worker, with the average even less than that. If I take you, I've all handed you a pamphlet here today, and uh, those who are joining us by uh, 
by Zoom should have it by email. And there's a graph on the inside with little red bars at the bottom um, right-hand corner. And it basically gives you an illustration that A being the dose that we give to a member of the public, to the dose that a member of our staff gets, compared to what does this really mean? The numbers don't mean much to anybody. A chest X-ray would be 0.5 millisievert, which is D. A brain scan would be 7 millisievert. And what anybody in this room would get due to natural causes over the course of the year would be F, which is 1.8 millisievert. So as a result of SRB, somebody living on average in Canada will get 1.8 plus 0 0.0024 from SRB in addition to any procedure that they had like a brain scan or an x-ray or so on and so forth. Next slide, please. In addition to performing regular fire drills, we also conducted a full emergency exercise in 2015. And we have another one planned in October 2021. We we're going to perform it last year, but with COVID, we didn't want to do a desktop one. We wanted to make sure that it was actually giving us the full value. So we're going to do one in October. And this exercise will be conducted in conjunction with the city of Pembroke as their part of their exercise and with the Pembroke Fire Department. And it will be observed from what we understand also by the regulatory body staff like the one in 2015 was. Next slide, please. As you're well aware, being uh, on the city members of council, public information and direct interaction public is very important. That's something we take very uh, seriously. Uh, we've conducted 188 plant tours between 2016 and 2020. I've also done presentations to service clubs. I've recently in the last year done one with the Kiwanis and Rotary Club. And like in 2015, the information pamphlet I provided you today will be sending those to anybody living within 10 kilometers of the facility. Last time we did that maybe a month or two before our license renewal. This year we decided to do it well in advance, almost a year, and we're gonna do it again right before the license. So it gives people the opportunity to ask questions if they have any questions regarding our facility. So that will be within 10 kilometers and according to Canada Post, that's 13,000 residences, businesses, establishments within the Valley, which is roughly what we did last time. We also operate a Facebook account, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, Reddit, and TikTok, which we often update with various things on the facility. And we operate a website that anybody can see at srbt.com. Next slide, please. So this uh, picture of our website there, you can see there's various tabs, uh, tabs that anybody can ex access. Um, next uh, slide, please. On the website, it's frequently updated. We have public notifications on anything that happens at the facility. And one thing that we're very proud of, unlike big uh, nuclear facilities that have licenses for handling radioactive material, we put everything on our website. Maybe because we're small, we don't have a lot of red tape, so there's not many of us that has to approve putting it on the website. But we actually have a copy of our license, our condition handbook, annual compliance report, which is a report that we do once a year that has all the results that we provide to the regulatory body. We also have a section on monitoring results. The presentation of today, along with others that we've made, will be on the website once it's done. We have information on tritium, radiation, emergency preparedness, the CNSC's inspection report. So if somebody's ever curious to see, I wonder what the CNSC, the regulatory body says when they inspect SRB, all their reports are on our website. We post them all. They also make once a year a report on our facility along with others in the industry in comparison. We also post those reports on our website so you can see that as well. We also post key SRB documents like our decommissioning plan, environmental risk assessment, so on and so forth. Um, We've um, also shown there various community support initiatives that we do. Like we said, we donated a lot of face shields to various facility. We are a strong support of the Christmas Angel Program, Valley Animal Rescue, Upper Valley Basketball Association that helps uh, young kids that don't have the means to take part in basketball camps, Festival Hall, Mainstream Community Services who uh, take care of uh, kids with special needs, Bernadette McCann House, and in addition to a number of others that are uh, close to our uh, staff and family. Next slide, please. 
the um, license application that I've all given every councillor, members of the public, a, um, a copy of. We've also sent to uh, Cheryl Galland's office, John Yakabuski's, a group that had issued concerns regarding our facility a number of years ago, Concerned Citizens of Refugee County. We send it to them. We send it to a number of Indigenous groups, and we send it to various uh, local media outlets that have done press releases on it. And we've also sent copies to all the individuals that we sampled our gardens and their wells. Next slide, please. One thing that should be important to note is um, this was a hot topic when we last got our license. We didn't have a financial guarantee or decommissioning plan fully funded and approved yet. Since then, uh, this is the second one that's approved. Now in 2020, we've revised the, prelim the preliminary decommissioning plan, which is basically you hire contractors to determine what activities and costs would take to clean your facility if you were to leave the facility tomorrow. Either went out of business for a reason or another or left. So contractors were hired and they determined that the cost came out to $727,000 to clean the facility from what it is today to clean state where anybody can walk in it from a daycare to anyone. Now, it's important to note that that amount of money also has contingencies in it where over the period of time that it takes to clean the facility, there's running costs. We've increased those by 10% in case there's increases. And all other costs like waste or cleaning has been in increased by 25%. So the cost would actually be quite a bit less than 727. But that is right now in the bank account in escrow for the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission to have in case the facility needed to be decommissioned. So that matter is closed now in case there was any issues on that. And what we do, we leave that in the account or we just let the interest roll in to account for any increases that happen due to inflation rate and so on and so forth. I think it's important to note, and um, before I finished, that in the last few years, next slide please, SRB received a number of achievement awards. Locally, we received the Innovation Award from Algonquin College. In 2017, we received from the Chamber of Commerce the Technical and Engineering Award. And again, later in 2017, the one we're most proud of, um, we went up against all the companies in Ontario and we're, I think, the first company in Pembroke to get an Ontario Export Award for consumer products and technology category. So we went down to Toronto and got that award, which we were very proud of. Next slide, please. Our future outlook is we're committed to expand our market for our existing products, because a lot of countries or places that don't know that our products exist. We're committed to developing new products. That's something that we're working on now, new application for the lights. We're also committed to expanding our own manufacturing capabilities. In the last couple of years, we added an injection molding machine and 3D printer, which basically allowed us to make those face shields. So, you know, you can do rapid prototyping with that. We're also committed to research emission reductions initiatives to reduce the dose and environmental effects as a result of our operation. And again, like we're doing today, we're committed to communicating with the general public, environmental groups, indigenous groups, and the nuclear community. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, Ross and I are available. Thank you very much. An excellent presentation, Stefan. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship. I just want to thank the two of you uh, for coming as our, our guests today. Uh, certainly, you're no stranger to our council. You've made uh, a number of presentations to our council, and, and I know as, as a member of this council, I appreciate that interaction. You, uh, you're not off uh, uh, doing something that the rest of us don't know uh, what it is that you're doing in our community. And for some individuals, when you... Uh, uh, when you're ignorant as to what something is, uh, you know, potentially going on, you you might uh, have certain fears or what have you. But you you're attempting to address that. You're you're putting out publications. You make presentations. I've been uh, at Kiwanis whenever you made the uh, the presentation to Kiwanis, and so certainly I appreciate all those efforts to uh, ensure that uh, the community knows uh, what it is that you're about, what it is that you're doing, that you have a, a high uh, uh, quality service and business that you're running in our community. One of my notes here is that uh, I certainly appreciate that you're uh, uh, hiring individuals in our community and providing them uh, 
great paying jobs uh, in our community. Um, so, uh, and even the, the item about the face shields, like there's a business that uh, um, cares and recognizes there's an issue. Everyone's trying to address COVID-19. It's a problem and so forth. And you step to the plate and it's like, okay, so what can we do as a, as a business to, to assist with this pandemic? And you, you step to the plate and you, you get the necessary equipment. And it's like, we can make face shields. We can do our part to try and, to, uh, to try and help out and so forth. Um, so kudos to, uh, to uh, the two of you for running such a successful business in our community in the city of Pembroke. Um, one of the items that you had on there, so in terms of questions, one of the items that you had on there is uh, that you have a regulatory process that you need to go through and uh, uh, there's a license you need to apply for and so forth. And you mentioned um, an organization uh, that uh, I'm aware from having sat at this table for a while uh, that was this uh, Concerned Citizens of Renfrew County. And so I'm aware that previously uh, they raised certain um, questions, uh, as I recall it, uh, last go around whenever you were applying for a license. And so I guess what my question is, is uh, so you're, you're out there, you're providing information, you're, you're doing what you can, uh, but in terms of that particular organization, has there been any questions, uh, comments, input from them during the course of this seven-year license? Stephen Levac, for the record, thank you for the question. Thank you for... Uh, um, the nice words that you've given us. And again, I'd like to invite everybody if they want to come for a tour at SRB to come like, like you have appreciated, we'd welcome you in. Um, we haven't, since the license was renewed last time in the six years, we haven't had one comment or communication from the individual, from the concerned citizens of Riverfrew County, not one. Um, We've had questions from other people that don't live in Pembroke. We had a few questions from people in Pembroke, but very little and none from the concerned citizens. Usually what the process for licensing happens is a number of months before the uh, Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission post in the regular media outlets, the paper, so on and so forth, that there will be hearings regarding our license. They usually announce a process by which there's participant funding available for individuals if they want to make presentations regarding SRB technologies or a facility, and usually there's an amount of money that's available for people. So maybe at that point, they'll come forward and make an application to do that. But up to today, we haven't heard anything in those uh, six plus years. Councilor Abdallah. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you, Stefan and uh, Ross, for your presentation and your commitment to the community and employing people and also your service to the community for all your support of different uh, groups. Um, your business is one of the key uh, characteristics that you know, we like to maintain an attractive business, medium-sized businesses like yours. Um, I enjoyed our conversation today on the phone. Um, I just have two questions. Uh, we talked about, a bit about it on the phone today, but could you let the audience know and council the environmental monitoring program you have, um, it's done in-house and then you're regulated by uh, an outside body audit. And also the second question, the transfer of the tritium, you know, where does it go and how does it actually come delivered to you and how is it uh, activated in the manufacturing process? Thank you very much for your words and uh, for the question. Uh, first, uh, we've, we've talked today about uh, some questions that you have, so I'll basically repeat them. First, um, a number of years ago, a third party was performing most of our environmental monitoring activities. It was a approved third party. We were using either CNL or the University of Ottawa. A few years ago, to have more control of it, and to save some costs, we decided to take on monitoring wells. Those were wells that weren't from members of the public. They were wells that we owned, that we drilled at different uh, uh, areas of the facility. We basically, our procedures were reviewed by the regulatory body, and we basically told them that we were going to do that, and they approved, they vetted us doing that. So since then, that was the only thing we were monitoring, other than downspouts from our facility that we monitor. Other than that, as a result of COVID-19, uh, the external labs weren't available anymore. So basically, we, ha we had some issues then. We already had a lab, 
We had an individual that we had hired from Algonquin College that graduated as an environmental lab technician that had been working closely with the third parties when they collected the samples, and we had the equipment to measure them, and we then shared with the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission that we were going to undertake these activities until the uh, COVID-19 resumed and we were able to do it. But we ended up doing it and doing it quite well. So we basically, down to today, maintain all of them except produce sampling that's being done by a third party still because we feel that that's a member of the public's garden that's being monitored. So we feel it would be more prudent to have an independent doing that. Same with residential wells and a business well that we monitor. We have a third party doing that as well, again, because that's owned by a member of the public. Milk, because we just don't have the capabilities to... Uh, monitor milk and produce, those two a third party does as well. Because there's a quite a bit more complicated than measuring well water or downspout water because it's, it's an opaque thing. You got to desiccate it. That's not something that we're able to do. But the things that we do do in the house, the monitoring wells, the air monitoring stations, we can do well. We provide the results to the regulatory body. They review them and we wouldn't hesitate any time if there was any issues to get the third party to do it again. But right now we're able to do them no problem. Ross well, Patrick, for the record, it's also uh, important to note that we also do intercomparison every year. So our equipment, we know that our equipment is matching up with, with the third parties and also Health Canada as well. Thank you. Yes, it's, uh, it's something that we do. We take the third party and we compare the results. Thanks for reminding me of that. And I think the second part of your question was, were you asking how the tritium comes to our facility or? Yeah. Um, we basically purchase the tritium from uh, Ontario Power Generation. Ontario Power gets heavy water from a number of reactors in Ontario and Quebec, Gentilly and Darlington, so on and so forth. And from the heavy water, they extract this tritium gas. They put it in containers and they ship it to CNL. And then we place a purchase order on OPG, and CNL, on behalf of OPG, ships it to us. We roughly get one container a month. The container is roughly the size of a uh, soda can, and the container itself cannot release tritium unless you heat it to a very high temperature. So we get the container in. We have certain procedures that we take place to make sure it's safe. We put it on our equipment, and then we decant it in small quantities, and that will last us for about three to four weeks. Thank you, Your Worship, and thank you for such an informative presentation. It's uh, much appreciated. Um, I do have one question. Uh, when you were talking about your 200 or so customers and, and the defense community, um, you did mention the U.S. Army as well as the British, but I didn't see the Canadian Armed Forces. Um, is that something that... Uh, that you're looking to in the future, or is it simply just an arduous procurement process that uh, our federal government has? Thank you for the question. Unfortunately, um, we met a number of years ago with the uh, Canadian military. We've done that a number of years. They used to purchase more from us, but they just don't have the budget uh, to be able to purchase. So some of our products are in use at their facility as you know, they just haven't bought, either replaced it or they're still using the same product because the product decays over time, the brightness decays, so they're using it with a very low brightness or not using it, unfortunately. So it's something we'd love to do, especially with the base being really close. We had a couple of trips down to national headquarters in Ottawa, and unfortunately they told us they're interested, but they don't have the, uh, the budget, unfortunately, to do it. Councillor Jackano. Thank you, Your Worship. I uh, want to uh, just congratulate uh, this wonderful facility and, uh, you know, to get a license approval from the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission is not an easy task. Uh, they make sure that you have all of your ducks in order and you better have them in order or there can be serious consequences. Uh, consequently, uh, over the number of years, you know, that uh, these folks have been in business, 
uh, spending six million dollars in the community, uh, providing great jobs with benefits that a lot of family, young families look forward to, has been uh, really uh, a milestone for everyone. But I, I only have one serious problem, and that is with the president of the company. Uh, he may not like what I'm going to say, but I will say it publicly. All the years that he's been in this community and knowing that the Pembroke Lumber Kings have a coach that's coaching the Toronto Maple Leafs, he still continues to support the Montreal Canadiens. I cannot fathom that, Your Worship. I just hope that they'll continue with many successful years in Pembroke as a business. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Plummer. Uh, just a uh, comment of thanks pretty much from the city on uh, behalf of your promotion of the city. I know that any, um, any committee that we've sat on or seen you at, you're always promoting Pembroke as a great place to be and also do business. And that's a really, the city uh, has to commend you on that because you are ambassadors of the city. Anytime people, all of us are really, when we leave this community, we have to, you know, we want to promote our own city and doing business and bringing you know, people back here and showing them what a great place it is to live in. And so just a thank you on behalf of the city, just saying you are a great promoter of the city. And thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, and I want to echo what uh, Councillor Plummer said, because thank you, Stefan, for sitting on our various committees in the city. And uh, also, uh, thank you for the transparency, and I think that's important for the, the community. And uh, your, your presentation this evening is very timely and very much appreciated. So, Ross and Stefan, thank you very much. And we're looking forward to continue working with you. Take care. Thank you, and we look uh, forward to spending many more years in Pembroke. Thank you. Thank you very much, and we'll bug you again in maybe eight months or ten months and come and make another presentation before our license renewal. That's fine. And maybe yeah. I'll wear my red, white, and blue, and Ross will wear his black, yellow, and uh, white jersey. Fred. Sound, sounds good. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. We'll go on to item A of our under new business, the Algonquin Trail. Uh, Mr. LaPierre. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, staff requires direction regarding the approved use of motorized vehicles on the portion of the Algonquin Trail within the City of Pembroke. The particular issue is whether snowmobiles or ATV type vehicles should be permitted, either, both, or none. The County of Renfrew Director of Development and Property Craig Kelly and Jason Davies, Forestry and GIS Manager, are joining the meeting via Zoom to provide an update on the trail and to answer any operational questions committee members may have. We also have Mayor Sweet as Chair of Development Property for the County of Renfrew with us this, uh, this evening via Zoom. So I'll ask our county colleagues to provide a, a review of the trail for, for the benefit of council members and the public and then I'll continue my report after that. Thank you. Um, go ahead, Craig, or who's going well, to thank, thank you very much, Your Worship. Perhaps oh. I could jump in there and introduce uh, our team that's uh, here this evening. 
and thank you uh, to members of council and yourself your worship for the opportunity to come here and hopefully we can go through uh, this and i know there has been over the years some sensitivity with regards to the the utilization of the trail but hopefully this evening we can give members of council and staff a, a comfort level uh, uh with regards to to the trail uh thank you to the ceo for introducing our, our team that's here this this evening uh, the other hat that I wear is I am chair of the Algonquin Trail Advisory Committee, and I'll just give you a quick, uh, quick uh, thumbnail sketch of the trail, but I'm sure you all know this. This is one of the largest, if not the largest, single continuous trail that uh, that is in the province of Ontario, over uh, 295, nearly 300 kilometers in length, and it stretches from Smith Falls all the way to, to, uh, to Mattawa. Uh, I'm very proud of the fact that uh, that we continue to stone dust the, the trail. Uh, it has been stone dusted uh, currently th through the the entire county of Lanark, and we are currently working in stone dusting the the trail within the county of Renfrew. Uh, I'm very pleased to to tell you that I was uh, very proud to accept something that uh, that as for for the county of Renfrew at any rate was the first time that uh, this has happened to them, and that was. We were presented with the Lieutenant Governor's uh, Award by the Economic Development Council of Ontario uh, for economic uh, opportunities uh, as a result of the trail. So I'm very pleased with that. Just to give you an idea too, that uh, we are continuing to look uh, out for grants and ways of uh, continuing to stone dust the, the trail so that uh, everyone can use it. And most recently, uh, we received a, a, a grant i suppose would be the best way to say it uh, about one and a half million tons of stone dust which is currently sitting in stone cliff and uh, stone du riviere pardon me and chalk river ready to be put on the trail so that we can complete the trail from mattawa all the way through to uh to smith falls we do of course uh would like to see this happen in the city of pembroke uh, and stone dust it in in, in that environment uh, let me just say to you, and, and then I'll hand it over to, to Craig, um, we've gone through two years of COVID uh, and we've come through on the other side, it's pretty healthy and uh, the trail has been an absolute uh, amazing recreation facility for those who, who needed some outdoor activities and uh, it has worked very, very well for all of the people uh, that have been using it. Uh, and I, I assume there are some within the city of Pembroke that are currently using it for walking and hiking and walking dogs and, and perhaps cycling, etc. But we'd like to get it to the point where it's like the rest of the trail uh, that is currently being used in Renfrew and uh, in my own community in Petawawa. And we're looking forward to, to doing other areas within the, the, uh, the, the trail itself. So um, we would like to, to move it forward and uh, hopefully this evening we can find some sort of uh, common ground as far as the, the trail is concerned and, and satisfy some of the issues with the, the city of Pembroke that they may have. So uh, I don't have a set uh, presentation uh, that, uh, that I can give to, to, to the, uh, the council. But I, I would like at this point, Your Worship, to hand it over to Craig Kelly and to Davis to, to give their presentation to uh, to your council. Thank you, Craig. Thanks, Chair Sweet, and uh, Your Worship and council members of the City of Pembroke. Nice to be here. It's been a while. Uh, we're not. I guess nice to be here in my house. I guess and 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 thank you for inviting us this evening. We appreciate it. Facebook reminded me it was four years ago, actually, we started doing the majority of the work in Renfrew and Armprior this day, four years ago. So it's it's funny how far we've come. And uh, Mayor Sweet, Chair Sweet, have, has gotten into some of the details. As a whole, this, the trail is now stone dusted from Smith Falls to Cobden. We've just completed a nearing completion of the last little section of money uh, that we put aside for um, a portion between Renfrew and Cobden, just outside of Cobden. Um, and uh, hopefully people will be biking and, and using their multi-use vehicles all the way up to Logos Land and Whitewater Brewery and every point in between. We've also completed, of course, from um, College Way all the way into Petawawa. We did that one of the first few things we did. And thanks to a partnership we formed with several municipalities, including your own, for the Ontario Municipal Cycling, uh, Commuter Cycling Program. And thank you to, uh, to the city years ago for assisting us through that process to get that done. 
I think it was a fall or the summer last year, Jason, we completed from McKay to Greenside uh, in the city of Pembroke, brushed it and stone dusted. And I think everybody acknowledges that, that portion of the city of Pembroke has some of the most beautiful vistas and unknown beaches of uh, in the area right along that whole section and people are enjoying it. Over the last four years of, of managing this trail, of course, we've managed issues and managed problems and managed expectations. We've managed uh, garbage uh, along the way. We've, we've dealt with the city of Pembroke on a, on a few occasions from um, uh, mostly folks that just discard things where they shouldn't, including uh, hotels for cats and uh, <laughs> sinks and dryers and everything else in between. So we've been dealing with bylaw infractions as they come up. We've been dealing with folks who decide to use the trail in a way that we would prefer them not to use it. That saying, perhaps speed, uh, um, unauthorized use, and we have become close friends with the SAVE team, our OPP uh, colleagues. We have formed partnerships with the Snowmobile Club, the ATV Club, and of CADA, the Cycling Club, all with great success. Like anything, there's a few bad apples, and we've tried to deal with those bad apples as they come. And we are in the midst of formulating the, the final stages of uh, fees of, uh, for bylaw enforcement. So if things go awry, they will be hit with strict fines. Right now, we, uh, we are dealing with the OPP and, and their own infractions, uh, their fees for infractions, but we're going to set some heavy fines. And we just have to make that uh, go through committee and then go up the chain to, to provincial offenses and make sure that those bylaws are dealt uh, appropriately. Uh, just this past spring, uh, Jason and his crew have installed a number of control gates through Laurentian Valley and into the city of Pembroke and getting that ready for future use. Uh, the next step is to uh, pack that section and, uh, and harden the slag that's there or, or at least grade and harden and put the appropriate stop signage in there. We had a great season last year. I think most will, well, this season wasn't great. The snowmobile season didn't have enough snow, but we had a great season. Uh, we got snowmobilers downtown Pembroke. We got them into businesses who spent their money. Snowmobilers are well known to travel with their wallets and spend two, three hundred dollars at a, at a time per day. And uh, I note that some of the businesses downtown Pembroke, um, Finnegan's, I think it was one of them, they created their own access onto the trail with our approval and are now allowing trailers and whatnot to park downtown to access that trail. So we've come a long way. And of course, you know, as youngsters, as we mature with this trail, our, our, knowledge, uh, our, our knowledge grows and we learn how to modify and work with the municipalities to make this work for everybody in a multi-use basis. And I think that's the key. Uh, from day one, uh, Chair Sweet and the original committee said it's going to be multi-use and, and open for everybody to use and we will manage it as we go and deal with situations when they come up. And we've been doing that very successfully. And, uh, and we still understand that some people have issues and we're trying to work with those groups to deal with that successfully. That means vegetation management or new vegetation for that matter, uh, appropriate uh, stone dust, appropriate speed limits, et cetera. So uh, what we're here today is to discuss uh, opening the trail in Pembroke. Uh, we are anxious to go. Uh, we have uh, just received uh, notice and we've just signed today ICIP dollars uh, for a section of trail. We're putting our own tax dollars towards that as well. And we're hopeful that other funds that we've applied to will come through in the next few weeks. And we're, uh, we're awaiting the notification for those funds uh, from several grants who have outstanding. We have a good feeling about some of them. Um, so we're, we're hopeful to get the section of Pembroke open and ready. It, it is a, a section that uh, we need connectivity it would be a shame to stop it at Highway 148 or at Old Mill Road and and not be able to go through the trail to through Pembroke and then join up uh, outside of Miramichi Lodge, that section, and go up to Petawawin Points North. So we, we are acting as the County of Renfrew, but on behalf of the whole region for economic development purposes, that people can travel through every town along that section and spend their dollars and enjoy recreation in a, in a safe and manageable fashion. So I think um, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll ask Jason if he has any future, any further comments, Jason, perhaps um, chime in there. Um, thanks, Craig, if I may, your worship. Um, just a reminder to council that um, there is just a small portion left to be done for the Algonquin Trail. As mentioned by Chair Sweet, Mayor Sweet, um, we've improved a major section between Pembroke Street East 
Penguin Street West, sorry, through to the, um, this, the town of Petawawa. We've last fall, as, as Craig mentioned, we've improved the section between McKay Street and Greenside. So there's only a small, about a 1.2 kilometer section that has to be improved. Um, yes, there's two major structures, the Muskrat River structure and the Alexander Street structure to be improved. But in the greater scheme of things, it's, it's still a small section to be done to complete that connectivity with the stone dust to be used by all. And another factor that um, has come to our attention late this spring or late this uh, summer was the discontinuation or the sale of that CN line. So the CN line now um, has been sold a major section of that CN line. So now the push is to open up this section through the city of Pembroke if, um, if we can work things together. So that's all I can have to add, add thank you. Uh, thank you very much. What we'll do now is take questions from uh, councillor or council uh, to either Mayor Sweet, Craig, or Jason. So, questions, councillor Plummer. I guess my question is uh, based on liability and safety. So, who's responsible if we decide to let, say, motorized traffic? Uh, we open up that section of trail and they cross, you know, Pembroke Street where uh, Traf um, this would be Trafalgar area. That's a very um, high traffic area. I know there used to be crossings that would drop down when the train was, was here. And then now I see the train, the tracks have been pulled. There's no crossing. So people just drive without even really paying attention. It's been a few years now. So who's really at fault there? If we, as a council, approve this and then someone goes out there and drives their four-wheeler or drives their skidoo across and get hit by a car, is it the city's Pembroke's responsibility? Is it the councillor that falls in our art because we approved it? Is it the county's fault? I just have concerns about that. Uh, oh. Jason, Jason, you've been dealing with, with legalities. Do you want to take that one on behalf of that? I mean, it's um, we, we've, we've had run into incidences, uh, council, and, and I'll, I'll let Jason handle that from a, a man's perspective. Uh, thanks, Craig, and if I may, through you, Worship. Your Worship, um, it's a case-by-case -case basis. Um, each scenario is different. Um, there's a cause and effect. Um, and, and with the 1% rule for, for an Ontario where which we, we live, um, a lot of people could be at fault theoretically. The County of Renfrew does have an umbrella insurance. So we have insurance for all our properties. So if, if it comes to that, the, the county's, county will be covered. Um, but again, it's going to be a case-by-case -case basis, and then the court of law will decide. So I, I, that's, I'm sorry it's, it's like that, but that's the, the direct answer. Thank you, uh, Councillor Abdalla. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have a couple questions. If the trail is allowed for uh, motorized traffic through Pembroke, uh, what mitigations will you implement uh, if noise, dust, and speeding and safety issues arise? That's my first question. Um, if, if I may, um, Craig, if you want to jump in by all means. So we always have, we always worked with, as, as Craig mentioned before, the OPP save team. We do have rules and regulations. We're improving our fine structure. Um, we do have bylaw people in, in the corporation ourselves. And we have partnerships. We have partnership with the Stolbeil Club and their patrol teams. We have partnerships with the ATV Club and their patrols. Um, and then when we deal with um, dust suppression, so we do, we do, complete dust suppression all the time. Even today we're doing dust suppression. So if there's a dust issue, we'll apply either calcium chloride or in either sensitive areas, we have a different environmentally friendly dust suppression material called pine tar. Um, and then for noise, we rely on the noise bylaw through the town or the city and the OPP. Thank you. If I could add to that council member, would you mind? So I think I just would like to add to Jason, thank you for, for filling us in on the dust. So um, I note that the OPP are starting operation decibel. And I would suggest that things like uh, noise is just as, as rampant on a, on a highway or a roadway as it could be on the trail and speed as, as much as, as that. So while we have limits in place and we have those rules, again, we reach out to the OPP to hope that they will enforce it when called upon. But of course, the OPP are not on the trail, not on the roads 24-7. So we try our best and that's why we're asking for uh, vegetation management to trees remain and bush remain so that will contain as much as we possibly can. Thank you, council member. Uh, my next question is uh, this, you mentioned Mr. Davis, the CN line that's been sold. So how can, so that means that nobody can access the Holiday Inn or Irving big stop 
uh, right once that's sold, it's sold now. That's that's done. The people, uh, snowmobilers and ATVers can't get out that way. It's my understanding through you, your worship, uh, through you. It's my understanding that is the case. However, I haven't received the final um, the final date of the transfer of those lands from CN to the proposed new owner. Um, if that is in the case, if that is in case the fact, um, it would be a challenge for any users to access um, that part of the trail that's remaining to those businesses. So that is correct, yes. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Reedy. Thank you, Your Worship. I suppose this question is um, likely for Mayor Sweet. Uh, the trail has been open going through Petawawa. Um, have you received many comments, concerns about this, or are people relatively happy with what's happening on the trail? Uh, thank you, Councillor. Through you, uh, Your Worship. Um, yeah, I, 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 I think that the trail has been very, very well received uh, in, in the town of Petawawa. We have a different scenario going through the town. Uh, we took advantage of, uh, of part of the management plan, which said that if we wanted to take the mechanized vehicles off, uh, pardon me, the walking and passive recreational vehicles off of the trail and put another trail parallel to that, uh, that uh, it would be on our nickel. And we applied for active transportation funding and uh, put a uh, asphalt uh, path through the through the town, which connected to the base uh, asphalt plant uh, uh, trail as well. So uh, by uh, for the most part, we have not had many complaints, if any, uh, with regards to that. Now, we are in a slightly different situation than we'll say by the city of Pembroke. Um, when I say that, um, there is not a lot of, uh, of ATVs, snowmobiles, etc., uh, that go through subdivisions because it's more parallel to the Petawawa Boulevard or, or the old Trans Canada Highway for, for those who remember it. Uh, but nonetheless, and I think it's important to also recognize, even though there is some dust that's, that's kicked up there, we've kept a very, very large portion of the the foliage and the trees and the brush uh, along that portion of the of the trail for that purpose it 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 deadens the uh, deadens the noise number one and, and secondly it, it takes care of a lot of the dust uh, that goes along there but nonetheless there's still suppression there i have to tell you that uh, honestly it is probably one of the best used facilities that we have within the town of petawawa uh, we're looking forward to uh, just a little bit later down the road, for example, for that particular facility to be utilized for a marathon race uh, with the military, the Iron Man Warrior race. Uh, th dozens of people are using it on a regular basis. I'm not going to say and sit here and tell you that everything is rosy. There are those who, who speed. There is no question about that. But, uh, you know, they're, they're one bad apple does not take uh, and ruin the whole barrel, I have to tell you. But... Uh, Councillor, it's, uh, it's a very, very well used uh, facility and the economic spin-off is just excellent for, for, for that. But there are challenges, there's no question. But as uh, Jason and Craig have said, we work at it and uh, through the, the wardens of the, uh, the ATV clubs and the wardens of the snowmobile clubs uh, to, to monitor their members as best they can. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jackano. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, this can be directed perhaps to uh, Mayor Sweet or one of the other representatives. Uh, I know how hard uh, Renfrew County has worked, Mayor Sweet, with you at the uh, you know you at the helm of the ship to get this project off the ground. We understand that, and I think we uh, in the future we all have to look to you know the extended developments of our communities so that we can continue to offer the things that many other places do not have. Uh, my only concern is, and I, I understand, I know the snowmobilers in the province of Ontario spend a billion dollars yearly spending money in traveling, purchasing uh, gasoline, uh, et cetera. And it's evident when you go by the, uh, you know, the Best Western and the Irving Big, Big Stop that you'll see perhaps a hundred snowmobiles there on a Sunday afternoon, where they're coming from, I haven't a clue. I, I've talked to a few people, but many of them are from out of the community. 
they're not from here and they come here to visit and they're exposed to the community. Maybe they'll come here and buy a house someday. Who knows? Uh, but we as a community have built a beautiful waterfront park, you know, and we've considered it uh, primarily as an area that is of a passive nature. And I'm not trying to uh, negate what you're doing, but I'm just saying, if you go there on a Wednesday or a Thursday night, you'll see families gathering there, people gathering there with their children, people taking their dog for a walk, you know, just looking at the sun going down on our beautiful Ottawa River. My question is, do we want to hear a convoy of 15 ATVs traveling across that area when a performance is being put on at our amphitheater, you know, local talent? Do we want to hear that? I, I, I don't know. What is the price, as you said, what is the price we have to pay? Uh, I'm not saying that people that would come by would be responsible, but if you have 15 people traveling on an ATV, you know, one behind the other, and skidoers travel in convoys, people travel as friends, as groups. Uh, is that the proper fit? I mean, that that question, you know, provides me with some consternation. Is that the proper fit? Not that I'm against development, not that I'm against motorized vehicles, but we've built something that, you know, if you had to re replicate that today, it's in multi-millions of dollars. The community came forward. And let me tell you, Amir Sweet, just wasn't our community. It was you guys too in Petawawa. You know, the contractors, Hoff, um, you know, the Hoffman, the Cluches. Uh, everywhere you look, there was a contribution. So should we perhaps not in kind say, you know what? This is going to be good for everybody. Maybe we should compromise a little bit. Can we control some of the hours during the summer entertainment? Is there a solution? But I'm not in disagreement with what you're suggesting. I think it would be good for the whole area. Uh, I just have a couple questions about that noise issue. You know, do you do I want to take my young granddaughter there? It's maybe a year old having a snooze, and 15, 18 years go by. You know, with a decibel rating of who knows what. It's a passive place. How do we continue to make it a passive place, or how do we coordinate both efforts together to make it a success for everybody? That's kind of my question. Thank you, Council Lafreniere. Yeah, I took some time to prepare what I wanted to speak about, and I'm starting to think that Councillor Jackno was sitting looking over my shoulder today when I was composing it. The Algonquin Trail. So many years ago when discussions first began around the purchase of the CP Trail by the County of Renfrew, I at that time, this is a decade ago, as uh, Mayor Bob Sweet, then warden, recalls, the county city liaison committee met and discussed this issue. At that meeting, I openly expressed the desire that the city be a part of these meetings. And as we know, CP apparently did not want to negotiate with more than one entity. So the county was assigned to work out the deal and the purchase of the rail bed. Um, I many times brought up the fact that, well, I certainly hope the city will be involved in the decision making as to what the use on that trail would be. And as you'll recall, uh, Mayor Sweet, you assured us that we're not going to force anything through the city. We won't be pushing any vehicular traffic through the city until you decide as a city what you want to be on those trails. Um, I was always nervous about the trail because I love the waterfront. Um, so many volunteers in our community have put a lot of sweat, blood and tears into the waterfront through floods, through different things, continuing to improve it and make it the people place it is. So it's no secret to anyone what my opinion is when it comes to vehicular traffic going through specifically the waterfront in the city of Pembroke. I was afraid that the vehicular traffic would be at our border someday and then it would be on the shoulders of the city. And here we are 
No, it is knocking on our borders, and we have to make this decision. And it's not a decision that's easy to make because, let's face it, they're at our door. They're knocking on our door now. But I ask you to picture this, Council. It's a beautiful summer evening or afternoon. You and your family are down at Pembroke's waterfront. Perhaps you're sitting on a park bench enjoying the sounds of nature. Others are enjoying entertainment at the amphitheater and an outdoor yoga class is also in progress. Everything is good. Then the rumbling sound of a group of ATVs is heard as they get closer, they get louder. Dust is kicked up while they pass through the waterfront. The yoga class is disrupted, the entertainers cannot be heard and the peaceful atmosphere is disrupted. It's clear. I'm not in favor of ATVs on the trail that runs through our downtown. Now you can say that businesses are supporting it, but just a few moments ago we heard that there was a restaurant and it was mentioned that this restaurant was downtown. Finnegan's is not quite downtown. Um, yes, they'll benefit, but to me, ATVs and snowmobilers are casual dining customers. They're not going to go into one of our fine dining establishments with their gear on, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that being said, I'm not in favor of ATVs. I live on a street where they are, the, the trail that they're using now, I live on Elgin Street, so they're all around me. They go down my street to access the trail, so they take shortcuts where they can. Sometimes there's things that are not ATVs. I'm not quite what, sure what they are. They're homemade contraptions. Um, they're loud. They're disruptive. Um, not all users are disrespectful, but I've sure met my share of them. Uh, when it comes to policing, I actually called the police one day on some ATVs that were going down my street, but by the time they responded, there was nobody around. So I, I question the policing aspect of this. I also question who pays. Now the OPP often have uh, stops, same as they do on the roadways. They do snowmobile stops, make sure people are abiding by the laws and not drinking. We would bear the cost of that, which sincerely bothers me. My final comment would be that the winter may be a different story for snowmobile traffic. Um, so I would be open to that as long as chicanes were in place at the expense of either the snowmobile clubs or the county, as well as um, a shared cost for any OPP. Um, I guess basically I want it to be a passive trail in the summer. It's going to be active living, cycling, walking, uh, running, and that's my opinion. Um, I would be happy to work with the committee to try to see if there was some way around the city another way. I know that I believe the CN Trail has still been leased to the snowmobile clubs. I don't believe it's a done deal this winter. I do believe that they have entered into an agreement, um, but I certainly would be happy to sit on a committee that would look for an alternate route if that one is not available. Those are my comments. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, just so that I, I'm, I'm clear, I'm reserving my comments till after we receive the uh, remainder of Mr. Lapierre's report. I do have a question for the, uh, the county representatives that uh, uh, have uh, joined us this evening to answer questions and so forth. Uh, the question I have is pertaining to the snowmobile go uh, club and the ATV club. Um, uh, the reason why I'm asking it is to remind uh, committee members as to the presentations that we've already received and certainly I think uh, there's been two if not three presentations that we've received um, sometimes jointly by those two clubs and sometimes uh, just the the one club but perhaps if our county uh, representatives can uh, comment upon uh, their their organizational structure their insurance uh, their uh, uh, approach to things uh, already in existence in Renfrew and Prior and other areas uh, trying to uh, uh, to address and meet the needs of the different municipalities and at the same time have a, a functioning uh, uh, trail for, for their uses as well um, because I'm, I am aware that there is uh, um, 
trails already in other urban centers throughout the province. Uh, and so um, we've already received and had the benefit of that, uh, that, uh, those presentations, but perhaps uh, as county representatives, I'm sure that you've already have been working with those clubs and perhaps you can comment on that because it, it, it will, I think, address uh, a lot of the different concerns that different committee members have in terms of uh, dust suppression, in terms of insurance issues, in terms of signage, in terms of what hours that the trail is being used, that sort of thing. Uh, Craig? Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. So we do have agreements in place with RCA TV and with Snow Country, uh, who is the umbrella group for several clubs in the Ottawa Valley um, under the OFSC. Both agreements uh, have carried a liability um, uh, insurance um, waiver to our satisfaction, to the county satisfaction. So as a user group, the only user group that we haven't engaged, uh, we've engaged is Alcata or the cycling group who use our trail and members walking and biking and horseback riding across that do not provide us with liability uh, certificate. They are not an organized group as such or a nonprofit. Uh, so we, uh, we accept that liability on behalf of those users. Uh, but the, the two clubs, the two motorized clubs, if you will, do provide us with liability insurance. And I'll, again, I'll note in every community that um, we want to call them urban communities, Renfrew, Arm Prior, Cobden now, um, Chalk River, uh, have, have worked with us very successfully to mitigate any concerns moving forward. Uh, we go right downtown Arm Prior, uh, right through the downtown. Uh, we go right through uh, downtown Renfrew, um, as, it, as it were, and, and into, into Cobden. So we are, are more than aware with, with running through downtowns, maybe not the size of downtown Pembroke, but we, we, we do work with them, uh, work with those municipalities quite well. Okay. If, if I could uh, just uh, jump in there, if you wouldn't, if you wouldn't mind, Your, your Worship. I'd yes, like go ahead. Say a couple of words, if I could. Um, there's another area that uh, that Craig hasn't talked about, and there's another one of the partners, and that's in Almont. And I have to tell you that Almont was probably as violently opposed to this trail as probably any urban environment that we have had within the, the trail itself. They've embraced this this trail. And they've worked very closely with it. In fact, they've they've designed a, a lot of their downtown uh, around this whole uh, snowmobile ATV section. With uh, with uh, and and the the community has come together and they work together and in harmony uh, to address some of the concerns that uh, Councillor Lafreniere has talked about. In in, in defence of uh, of uh, some of the things that uh, that uh, Councillor Lafreniere said. Um, it is absolutely true. This, this, this process has been going on for 12 years. I started uh, acquiring this uh, in 2012, and you're right. Uh, CP uh, themselves wanted to deal with one, one group and one group only, and I know that was uh, somewhat of a contentious issue. I understand that. Uh, but nonetheless, that was the way that, that they wanted it to, 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 to happen. In defense of, of, of some of the comments that were made, I've tried very hard over the years to, to keep the city of Pembroke in the loop in terms of, uh, of what we're doing or what we're trying to do. I've asked over the years to, to express the concerns to us and see what we can do in order to mitigate some of the challenges and some of the concerns that have been brought forward. I think over the years we've been able to do that with a lot of uh, other uh, municipalities within not only in Renfrew County, but we're currently working also uh, to, to satisfy the, the, the group in, in, in Mattawa, et cetera. Uh, and with Lanark County, there is two groups uh, that here, so that you'll know. There's the, the uh, Algonquin Trail, which is the one that's within completely within the county of Renfrew, but there's the Ottawa Valley Recreational Trail, which is the partners group, which is controlled by a management uh, plan and we meet on a regular basis to, to, to go over these concerns and the concerns are speeding, the concerns are noise, etc. And we we work with them. But I can't fix something if I don't know what it is that you want fixed. I, I, I understand. There's no question that the waterfront is, is, a, is a wonderful facility. There's no question about that. Uh, not all ATVs do uh, or snowmobiles go at 70 miles an hour. Uh, I see them going through my community and when I talk to the ATV clubs and they realize that the speed limit was 20 kilometers an hour, those 
the members of that club know that and they don't go over that speed limit. There are rogue individuals who are not part of the uh, of the ATV club, that's for sure. But uh, the members of the ATV club themselves control it because they know themselves that if too many things happen on the trail, it's going to hurt their 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 uh, their ability to utilize the trail. So, Councillor Lafreniere, I I work constantly to try and keep you and and your member the members of your council abreast of what's what is being going on, as I do in Smith Falls, as I do in Mattawa, as we do in the city of Ottawa. Um, uh, so uh, if there are issues, and that's why we're here this evening, is to try and find a solution uh, to some of the, the impasses that have been presented. And hopefully we can find that. I, I, uh, Councillor Giacomo talked about some way of getting some sort of harmony with the, within this. And there's got to be a way of doing this and uh, not to destroy the ambience that you've got at the, at the waterfront, if that is the issue that is most urgent with uh, with the city of Pembroke. We, we, we've got to be able to find a solution to this particular situation. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sweet. Uh, I'm going to reserve my comments uh, when we discuss this after, after Mr. Pierre finishes his report. So basically, what I really, I really want to do is thank you, uh, uh, Mayor Sweet and Craig and Jason, for being here this evening and listening to the comments and also updating us in regards to the trail. So thank you for participating that way. And what we will do now as a council is uh, continue uh, the discussion as far as the Algonquin Trail is concerned. So once again, thank you for participating. It's very much appreciated. And I'm sure we'll be able to come up with a resolution um, uh, in, in the near future. Thank you again. Thank you. Uh, Mr. LaPierre, can you continue your report, please? Thank you very much. I don't want to disrupt the debate because there's a lot of good discussion going on. And I have provided uh, a significant amount of information in my report to you in written form. However, I will, you know, I will go over it especially for the benefit of those that are tuning in this evening that have an interest in this. And part of it is a refresher because this has been ongoing for some time and it's involved our city, it's involved our county, it's also involved Lanark County and you do have my previous report here that indicated that uh, Lanark County did a two year review and they also have a comprehensive management, uh, management program in place. So there's a lot of information that's out there. Um, I'll go to December 1st, 2020. Uh, there was a report provided to Council that indicated the support of allowing use of the trail by snowmobiles, ATVs and UTVs within the city by the local business community. And you have that report uh, in your package. And in addition to that, uh, we received a separate email from the manager of the Comfort Inn indicating the importance of the, uh, of the trail here and allowing multi-use. On December 15th, that's when Council directed that uh, for the season 2020 and 2021, that winter season, that from Greenside to McKay Street, that snowmobiling would be permitted. Uh, Council also directed staff to conduct a survey of those that would be deemed to be most, uh, most significantly impacted being those people along the corridor through Pembroke. So what we did was we sent out a sir, we sent out notice, inviting comments to approximately 110 property owners within 120 meters of the rail. We also placed the matter on our social media sites and invited people to call us if they preferred to do that. So I can advise as a result of that that we did well. We did receive some comments through social media, however. We received a few, but they did not uh, follow the instructions that we had placed that that we wanted a Pembroke address so we could verify, you know, that they're a resident of the city of Pembroke and not somebody sitting somewhere, southern Ontario or who knows where. Uh, so they didn't follow that. So we did not include those few comments for the purposes of this report. I can advise as it relates to the uh, to the comments received. We received four responses, okay? and we also made sure that we sent this to Supple's Landing because a committee indicated a special interest in making sure that they were aware of what was happening and provided the opportunity to comment. So out of those four comments that we received, one was a local business not associated with tourism. 
uh, and they were in favor of use of motorized vehicles. We received uh, comment from a couple of property owners in the east of Pembroke and our county colleagues referenced them not by name but by the issues that they raised. They were concerned. That, first of all, they said they didn't see a lot of snowmobiles on the trail from where they were. They were concerned about the speeding. They were concerned about uh, cleaning up of trees that had been cut and garbage that had been placed there. I contacted the county and they did go out there and they took care of uh, all of that. Also got comment from a property owner uh, and local business person indicated his full support for motorized use for the trail in support of recreation and economic development for the community and the area. Also received comment from a property owner that said the trail should be designated as non-motorized to be enjoyed by people walking, dog walking, snowshoeing, etc., indicating that motorized machines, in this person's opinion, are not compatible with non-motorized activities due to safety risks of people and animals. He's also concerned about a potential noise issue. We also received a, a voicemail from an individual uh, property owner within that notice area and he did indicate that his tenants complain about the speed of the snow machines and maybe speed signs should be put up. It was that comment was. Uh, you also received by letter uh, September 30th from the Horticultural Society suggestion that the city consider no access for motorized vehicles traveling near the waterfront for the period of June 1st through August 31st. Their concern of course, of course was potential for noise disruptions to the tranquil atmosphere of the waterfront. Uh, staff contact the Township of Laurentian Valley to see where they are at with respect to the trails and, uh, and users. And they've indicated that dialogue continues with various parties, but they are struggling to find an alternative route to propose. Did contact the OPP with respect to occurrences on the Algonquin Trail within the city, and we just recently got the response uh, indicating a focused analytical report was uh, indicating that between November 11th, 2020 and March 31st, 2021, there were zero occurrences within the city of Pembroke proper associated with Algonquin Trail. So with respect to financial implications, we could expect if, uh, if approved, uh, definitely the, the snowmobile uh, part of this request would be that there would be some minor maintenance costs expected at the uh, crossings in the city with respect to asphalt. And as far as financial implications to local businesses, that would be dependent on council's decision. So that is my report, uh, and I'm certainly willing to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you, Mr. Pierre. Before, and I'll ask for council's indulgence, I've not made any comments whatsoever in regards to this, but I'd like to, uh, at, at this moment, number one, uh, and I understand fully as uh, Councillor Lafreniere, uh, with, with her comments going right back to 2000 and, in 12 that this has been an ongoing issue and it's important that as a council that we make a decision. Um, I've, I've come at, at, at the Algonquin Trail from the economic development point of view since I've been mayor uh, because tourism is so important to this area that uh, I, I think the multi-use of the trail and I understand mitigation has to take place in regards to noise and, and speeding. And, uh, but, but I think if we're, going to, if we're going to really take tourism, and we should be, uh, hopefully after we get out of COVID-19, seriously, it is important for the businesses within the city, uh, the restaurant business, the hotel businesses. And I think it's important that we always keep that in the back of our mind. Um, overall, I think that the people within the city of Pembroke are in favor of the multi-use, but of course with mitigation. The example that uh, was used in regards to uh, the waterfront, I agree fully. And I did, and I didn't want to discuss this uh, uh, with the county present, but Mayor Sweet and I uh, did discuss it because I said, look, that, that is going to be a major issue. And I know we've spoken off and on uh, in regards, and I've spoke to some of the businesses in town where, as an example, uh, I'm not overly concerned about the waterfront in the wintertime, and I don't think any of us are. But it comes down to, and I'm in full agreement with the Horticultural Society, what can we do? Well, one thing that can be done is we take 
and follow the regulations in the province of Ontario, the highway uh, regulations, and the, the ATVs could get off at the bottom of uh, McKay Street, go all the way down and get back on at College Way avoiding the park. So there are possibilities where we could move things around, but um, um, I think it's really important that, that, that we consider the finances of this city, uh, we consider the taxpayers of this city, and we consider uh, you know, the importance uh, that tourism is to uh, the, the segment of our population. And I understand the mitigation, and there's so many things we have to take into, into consideration. Um, so thank you for the indulgence. All right, now comments. Uh, Councillor uh, Abdallah. <clears throat> uh, well, I'm going to make a motion and then hope I get a seconder and then we can talk about this motion. And then if ATVs come up, I can talk about that separately. Um, motion to support a two-year trial period for snowmobile access on the Algonquin Trail through the City of Pembroke with the City of Pembroke and County of Redford staff to work together in addressing and resolving any ongoing safety and operational issues. Um, then I'll speak about the details of the motion after, but that's my motion. I wanted to keep it uh, short and sweet. <clears throat> A seconder for the motion, uh, Councillor Lafreniere. I will second that, that motion. Thank you. A motion on the floor, so discussion. So can I speak? Yes, you okay. can. So um, I was uh, speaking with the CAO during the recent weeks about his report and I was glad to see that there was no, uh, I was going to add to this motion that the County of Renfrew pay 60% of the calls for service, but um, that is something that can be worked out between the County Liaison Committee. If uh, calls for service got out of hand, this is something that our council representatives and Mr. Lapier as CEO would bring up to them to work out these problems. Um, the, also the issue of safety. Uh, safety is a major thing here and uh, chicanes or gates need to be agreed upon by the city and the County of Renfrew and the Snowmobile Club at critical areas. Where are we, go where are we going to uh, install these gates or chicanes, whatever you want to call them, to mitigate and slow down the traffic? That's very important. Um, Councillor Plummer has uh, brought up, and we've discussed this before, um, the Miramichi Lodge crossing at Trafalgar Road. How are we going to mitigate that uh, possible accident? So I've seen, I have seen these uh, big stop signs, bigger than normal, at that area. So that is something that has to be done. Um, I realize the impact of tourism and economic development. I, I fully support economic development, but we also have to think of community development. Snowmobiles are a different situation than ATVs, and we can talk about that later. But I'm willing to uh, support a two-year trial period to work out the issues, and hopefully it'll be positive. If it's not positive, then Pembroke would have to say no. But I'm confident in the County of Renfrew and in talking to Terry Voudry of the, the Snowmobile Club that things can be worked out and we can finish the trail through Pembroke for snowmobiling and have the economic development and the enjoyment. Um, the Trans-Canada Trail goes all the way across Canada and they have a Greenway vision. And their Greenway Trail promotes non-motorized uses in the summer and skiing, snowshoeing, and snowmobiling in the winter. And that's what I support. You know, we talk about active living, but I do realize that winter is different. Um, snowmobilers are welcome in Pembroke, and I hope by supporting this motion for a two-year tri two trial period with proper safety set up, that things go positive and we can make this a permanent thing through the city of Pembroke for snowmobiles. ATVs we can discuss later, but this is the motion as it stands. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. Council? Councillor Reavy. So my recollection is that we've already tried a trial with the snowmobiles. That was last winter. 
a half a year. But even still, we have, we have experienced what that can mean. So I'm not sure somewhere within the CAO's report um, was referencing it's either both or none. So I don't know where we stand. I mean, there are things with ATV use that I'm not certain all of council is understanding. And I was prepared to ask um, for maybe members of RCATV to bring a few bikes down to the trail in Pembroke where we could go out and see what a bike or a few bikes doing 20 kilometers an hour sound like, smell like, the type of dust they raise. Because I don't, I think that we all have preconceived ideas of what the noise and dust will be. So I don't think I'll support this motion because I would like to see a trial for both snowmobile and ATV use and, of course, thinking along the lines of the mayor, can we redirect the flow away from the trail um, for the marina area? Other comments? Councillor Lafreniere. Um, although we did have a, a short trial period, it was not through the entire waterfront. So it only went as far as McKay, I believe, uh, and then they had to go back. So I would be interested in seeing a trial of it coming through the waterfront, setting up the proper gatage or chicane signs, that kind of thing, and seeing how it goes. Um, I would rather spend more time on if we're even going to think about ATVs. Um, I would only be interested if, as the mayor said, we could come up with an alternate route for the ATVs, not to disrupt the users and the tourists that already come to enjoy the waterfront as it is. Uh, economic development in its uh, progress is only good if we don't lose the tourists we've already gotten. We already have a captive audience down there in the summer. We have two to three hundred people when COVID isn't happening coming to the yoga. Um, yoga is full right now, but we have probably two to five hundred people an evening down at the waterfront doing different things. Um, we don't want to lose that base because now there's vehicular traffic traveling through there. So you can't bite off your hand to, to save your face type thing. Um, anyway, I'm going to be supporting this motion in the hopes that we can work on an ATV alternate route plan. And that will take some time as we well know, but at least we can move ahead with the snowmobiles and then work on a plan. We weren't part of the discussions all along. Um, as, the, as Mayor Sweet said, they have an Algonquin Trail Advisory Committee. I do believe there was a couple of representatives from our city missing on that committee that could have been discussing these over the last decade. So, sorry I said that out loud, but that's my feeling. Um, and as Mayor Sweet said, they have a different situation in a lot of these communities. In Petawawa, it runs along the highway, doesn't run through a beautiful waterfront that we are all so proud of, that our volunteers work so hard on. So anyway, I'm not going to go on and on because you know how I feel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, so I was around when uh, the county decided to uh, create uh, what I believe to be a wonderful trail. Um, I am aware uh, what he's saying is, is true because I made efforts to try and contact the folks from the CPR myself and they, uh, I was trying to educate them that the city of Pembroke is a single tier municipality and frankly we were on the same footing as the county of Renfrew. Unfortunately the CPR did not uh, want to, as Mayor Sweet has said, engage more than one entity they wanted to deal with one i can understand why because um, you would have situations such as what we're faced with now which is uh, they were addressing the county of renfrew wanting to uh, uh, see whether the county of renfrew would purchase it based upon what terms uh, and if they had to deal with too many entities including the city of pembroke uh, there would be differences in, of opinion and so as a result uh, there's the potential for uh, dissent and uh, the CPR folks didn't want that and I can understand 
in retrospect why they made the decision, although I can say at the time, was I ticked? Yes, I was very ticked that um, as a member of city council, uh, the city was not being um, allowed to have a uh, say at the table. Having said that, uh, after, if it's a decade, it's a decade, so after a decade I've obviously mellowed on that particular topic. Uh, trying to look at what is the bigger picture. Uh, and I know that every single one of us sitting here is always thinking about the ratepayers and uh, all ratepayers of the city of Pembroke. Um, and so I appreciate the tone that the, uh, the mayor has set. And I got to tell you, in the last two terms, uh, the, uh, uh, the current one and the previous one, the mayor has always set a tone for our council. And uh, we may not always always agree, but uh, the mayor has always set a tone and had the best interests at heart for our municipality, and I'm sure I know that all of us do. One of the things, though, that our uh, municipality uh, has for the last two terms now, so nearly two terms, is had an economic development focus. So we've created different tax ratios. We've enhanced the CIP program. We've created economic development advisory committee. We've engaged in discussions with various stakeholders. We've rezoned properties to allow commercial development. We have gone out of our way to make sure that the city of Pembroke uh, is striving, is moving ahead, and doing what is essential, which is to um, try and move the tax burden off of who our principal uh, payers are, which is our residents, unfortunately, as opposed to spreading it out over commercial, industrial, uh, and the residential tax base. When I think back uh, over the years, uh, some of it is prior to my involvement on council, and I'm going to pick on the Algonquin College for a moment. I think the Algonquin College and the placement of it at our waterfront is, was an excellent idea, was an excellent decision by City Council at that time uh, to engage in discussions with Algonquin College at that time. But I can also tell you that there were dissenting opinions. I talked to some individuals that did not want to see it there. In fact, on the weekend, not that he was complaining about it, but my father-in-law was saying that from Christie Street, you know, I used to be able to see the Ottawa River. Well, sometimes when you're trying to move forward and you're trying to have development, uh, you know, things happen and things change. Uh, so in particular, in terms of trying to address the Algonquin College, what a wonderful idea because now we have a state-of-the-art facility. We have kids that don't need to necessarily go away for school, but over 50% of them are coming to the city of Pembroke, are spending their dollars here mainly their parents' dollars, but they're spending dollars here. There's economic activity. Why? Because the council of the day said, okay, we have this waterfront, but you know, the college can fit. The college can fit there and we'll make it work. And it's done it. It's assisted in the development of our, uh, of our uh, downtown core uh, in addition to the waterfront. Another item that I thought of is the Rogers Towers. So everyone wants their cell phones and wants the cell phones to work, and, and uh, you know I get that. But not everyone agrees the fact that we have cell phone towers now inside the city of Pembroke. But again, it's one of those things that if you want to be an urban center, there are certain things that come with the urban center. Another one is taller apartment buildings, and there's one that uh, crosses my mind in particular. Um, there are certain residents that live near there that do not like the taller apartment buildings, but the fact of the matter is it's, it generates homes for people uh, and it generates increased taxes for our tax base that isn't just strictly the residential uh, tax base that we all pay from our homes. So there's a number of different instances where the uh, city council uh, has had to say, okay, what can we do in this particular situation? It might not be popular with everyone, but we all need to play in the same sandbox and we need to look at improving the city of Pembroke for all ratepayers. And I appreciate one of your comments, your worship, that uh, it, it would appear uh, and seems to be to my uh, understanding uh, that the majority of the ratepayers of the city of Pembroke would take no issue with the use of ATVs and snowmobiles at the waterfront, in other words, motorized use, in addition to the passive use. Uh, there's one uh, individual that I won't name, but he contacted me and said, you know, he skis and I know him. He's 
done triathlons and things that I'll never do, but uh, he's done triathlons and so forth. And he says when he meets someone, they're courteous. And, and I, I understand there's, there's going to be exceptions. I, I take no, uh, you know, I'm not naive. Um, I'm also aware, though, that the, the uh, OPP do their best, attempt to do what they can, and they can't be everywhere. And I'm aware that on our city streets that there are people that engage in racing. There's people that uh, have loud exhaust systems, and that's why we have a police services board that works with the OPP to do what they can. Um, which gets us to what the impasse uh, seems to be, is that there are a number of uh, what I would call uh, uh, issues uh, that uh, um, practical issues, which is what I understood that in, in December when I made the motion that I did and it was defeated, I understood then that staff was going to go away and do certain things, which they have, and I've read the report several times, and as usual, Mr. Lapier's reports are, are excellent in terms of trying to address all the different issues. It's why I asked uh, one of the, about the only question I asked of our county representatives that were in attendance tonight, um, it's to remind us all that the, the ATV club, like the motorized users that we're talking about, the ATV club and the snowmobile club have attended here before to address what the concerns are. Are they willing to put up larger signs? Yes. Do they have insurance? Yes. Do they have a board of directors? Yes. Are they willing to do what's necessary to do what they can uh, to make sure it's safe? To the issue of liability, that's why I asked the different questions because I know from these presentations that the ATV club, the snowmobile club, they all have insurance. I'm not naive. Again, if, I, if uh, an incident happens at one of these crossings, will the city of Pembroke get sued? Yes, unfortunately, the city of Pembroke is going to get sued. I'm not naive. Uh, a lawyer will sue with a shotgun and sue everyone on site. I, I get that. But you need to, here's all the risks. Here's what the issues are, whether it be noise, which uh, I, I know that uh, there's some that are better versed that can tell me about four strokes and the, the noise that it emits. But I also know about vehicles that are driving with excessively loud exhaust and the OPP doing their part to address it. But there are ways, and I think that's what His Worship is trying to, to again, lead us, as, as he has on countless occasions, is lead us forward and say, okay, so how can we get past the impasse? How can we allow everything to coexist to, so that we can have economic development, so that we can have it all. Uh, and I think we can have it all. With the current motion, I do not believe that we can have it all. We have attempted and have had uh, a trial version and seemingly no reports to the OPP. Uh, um, and I'm not naive. I'm aware that some uh, will indicate, well, uh, you know, someone was, was driving fast. Well, I can tell you before the meeting started, the OPP is asking me what streets are hot spots for noise. And they're asking me because I get certain complaints. No matter if it's on the trail, off the trail, on the street, uh, in people's backyards, doing fireworks, whatever, there are always individuals that will not obey the law, and so that's why we have a mechanism for enforcement. The city, or sorry, the county of Renfrew has obviously gotten wise, uh, and um, is uh, uh, instead of just solely relying upon the OPP, for the first time I've heard this evening, is they're indicating, okay, we're going to set up. Um, what Mr. Lapier might call short form wording. We're gonna have charges that are available so that we can address certain instances. So they're not relying solely upon um, the, uh, the, the, the city of Pembroke or the OPP to address it. They recognize that, okay, they obviously have a concern. I suspect that they may have had a concern elsewhere, but this is not, uh, as, the, as it was pointed out to me on one occasion, we're not the first urban centre to have a trail going through it. Um, I, I know Mayor Sweet talks about Almont and Iron Prior, Cobden and so forth. This is not unique to Renfrew County. Uh, there's trails all over the place. Um, why? Because they, they work, they create economic activity. Uh, uh, Councillor Jackano was talking about the, uh, the extensive amount of money that uh, snowmobilers spend. Well, ATV folks are the same. Like when I, when I was younger, I used to go over to Quebec and we used to go from Waltham, uh, um, Otter Lake, uh, Fort Collange, uh, all these different places. And trust me, I dropped a lot of money, uh, but uh, it was good for them. It was one, an activity that I wanted to do. Why can't we benefit from the same activity? You see all the different businesses saying, yes, let's, let's have this happen. I don't hear a whole plethora of residences and ratepayers saying to me, Ron, don't, don't vote for that. That, that's, that's, that shouldn't be permitted. 
Long story short, you, you know how I felt in December. Um, I haven't changed. If anything, my resolve has, has uh, continued to, to uh, uh, move forward. I think that there's a way as mayor, as our mayor, forget about the county of Renfrew, our mayor is saying there is a way that we can move forward. We can address concerns about whether it be dust uh, and, and you know, whether it be you know, dust suppression, vegetation, whatever. We can address all the different issues. We can put up all the crossing guards. We can have operations uh, address issues of snow that comes across on the roadway and making sure that it gets cleaned up so that as a motor uh, vehicle operator, I'm not gonna run into any issues as I travel across the intersection. Um, we can address all of those things. I am adamantly confident of that and at the same time reap the benefits of the economic development spinoffs, not only for the snowmobiles, but the ATVs. So for all those reasons, I won't support the current motion that's put forward. Uh, the notion of this all this economic development flowing into the city has there ever been a report or showing what numbers uh, i certainly don't recall of if this trail doesn't happen we are losing x or you know, something like that uh, mr lapier no we have not done a specific study the only ones i can think the county might have might have looked at it uh, you know, in conjunction with uh, Lanark County and others. But the only ones I recall, and I'm going back in my days as economic development officer, was the Association of uh, Snowmobile Clubs. And they did some comprehensive economic impact studies across Ontario. And I forget the numbers, because it was probably 20 years ago or so, but they were significant. I do remember one of the president of that group actually came from the Pembroke area. And I do know that at that time, and I sort of heard it earlier, that uh, the saying was is that snowmobilers, all they pack is their wallet. But I do recall that the economic impact was significant at that time, but I cannot point to any recent study that I'm aware of. Yeah, well, thank you for that. I, I just, I have concerns that we're only going to be a drive through because we do see that yes there is finnegan's that's on the trail yes but i'm also how are you going to get gas now like you're supposed to drive up the hill to canadian tire gas bar jump a you know to jump across the parking lot or are they going to go to the clarion drive their park their skidoos on one side of the road and then walk across and it's just it's hard to envision i guess that's that's it with seeing a trail that goes through our downtown that really doesn't pass any significant stops that when you can go right up to Petawal and there's the Marriott that's right along the trail or there's a gas that's right along the trail. Um, it just seems that there's a lot of push here to get this done and understand that to, for this connection, but I don't really see a giant net benefit for the city just because we're letting these um, economic, or these snowmobiles and four-wheelers go through our downtown. Thanks. Councilor Jackano. Your Worship, uh, in regards to economic development for snowmobilers, if you take a drive on a frosty Sunday in the winter and look at the Best Western and every parking lot is filled and you look across to the Irving Big Stop and there's 150 skidoos there and they're not from Pembroke and they're mind you maybe they're not right downtown but they're supporting you know the local business of that motel they're supporting the uh, the irving big stop as well i think i have a solution for the uh for the trail uh, going through pembroke and this may sound a little lunatic but i think it would work build a buffer soundproof on one side facing the waterfront what is it a kilometer and a half coordinate that with the county of renfrew to get uh, funding for that particular type of a buffer and you know they said yes we have it in alma we have it here and there but you know what they don't have it going right through their waterfront and that's the only difference but if you travel along the queensway or in toronto or the don valley parkway you will see these buffer fences that were people's homes about right to the freeway the sound is insignificant and I mean, if that could happen, we'd have a solution. You could have, uh, you know, the, the people going through uh, the ATVers, uh, the skidoers, 
and you're going to have a happy group of people at the waterfront because they're not going to hear them. Or if they hear them, it'll be very slight. And the music that's taking place at the amphitheater will, uh, will outblast them. That's my feeling. And as Councilor Reeve said, you know, let's hear what 10 of them sound like in a row. And I mean, I'm sure there's money for buffering, especially when we're trying to preserve this wonderful multi-million dollar waterfront park that we've had that's been built with community support, uh, you know, by people going there, volunteering, screwing boards into a deck. Uh, the large companies, as I said to Mayor Sweet from Petawawa, uh, they all kicked in. They didn't say, no, we can't help you. How can we help you so that this will be for everybody? Let's build a buffer. Let's try it. Um. Okay, I think what we will, there is a motion on the floor. Um, Councillor Lafreniere. Yeah, this would be my final comment until this motion, at least. You know, <clears throat> 10 years later, here we are. We're up with our backs against the wall. We, we have some questions. Um, there's nothing wrong with what Councillor Jacknell just suggested. So this is the kind of thing that should have been talked about three or four years ago. The county's been saying this trail is going to be multi-use for years when it wasn't really approved to be multi-use by our council. So why can't we take a little more time? I mean, they finally asked us now. They were here tonight to talk about it. Why do we have to make a decision tonight when we've just opened up the conversation with them? Like, I really think if we approve the snow machines, we can work on the ATV, the sound barriers, the things that maybe can accommodate it. But you know, I have to say that I agree with Councillor Plummer. I don't see a huge economic spin-off other than what we already are seeing from the snowmobiles. And if the snowmobiles are allowed to come in, they'll stay at the Clarion, they'll stay at the Comfort Inn, they'll go to Finnegan's on their ramp. The Best Western in Irving, they might be out of some luck because I don't know that the trails are going to still go up there. I, I'm not really sure about that if, that's, if the CN is closed. But I think we move ahead with snowmobiles we advise the county that there's still some work to be done before we allow ATVs to come through our city. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to call for the vote, but I'm going to make one final comment. I can't support. I cannot support the motion, and uh, for the simple reason that it's another trial. We've done that, and we've shown that that it will work. So I won't be able to, to support it. But I think we should vote on this particular motion, and then decide what we do next. So I'm going to call the motion. Um, all those in favor. Can I get a recorded vote? Yes. Go ahead. Yes, we okay. anticipated that. Uh, did you want the motion re-read? Are you satisfied Do you want to re -read with it? it? If yes. Please. Yes. Go ahead, Councillor Dollar. Just reread it. Motion, oh, motion to support a two-year trial period for snowmobile access on the Algonquin Trail through the City of Pembroke with City of Pembroke and County of Renfrew staff to work together in addressing and resolving any ongoing safety and operational issues. Okay. Deputy Mayor. Nay. Councillor Reavy. Nay. Councillor Abdallah. Yay. Councillor Plummer. Yay. Councillor Fernier. Yay. Councillor Giacono. Nay. Mayor LeMay. Nay. Okay. So I have four to three. The nays, the motion is defeated. All right, what I'd like to, like to uh, recommend at this stage is that I, I think we have to uh, go back to the drawing board, but it'll take, in, take uh, comments from council in regards to going back to staff. As For instance, there were some, some more questions that we should look at, Councilor Plumbers, in regarding uh, the economic advantage, and I think that, that, that also is an important question. Um, and, and I'm sure we can get, for instance, that particular information. Um, I, I think as a council, we have to make a, a d decision. It's either going to be a multi-use trail or not, which means it involves the approved motorized vehicles. 
and then make that decision, yes or, or a no. But from the sounds of, uh, of what we're doing right now, I think it would be important that we get some additional uh, facts. Um, and, uh, and I think it's very important that as a council, we make a decision before the end of this year, which probably means for the winter time, which means October, which means that we would be asking staff, okay, here are some questions that, that we want you to go out and get and bring back. But I think we, ha we have to, as a council, look at it as a multi-use trail, yes or no. Uh, anyway, could I just have some comments on, on how we should move forward? Councillor Abdalla. Well, the, uh, the ATV question, the concerns are the noise and the safety. And I've spoken to over 100 people at the waterfront. We all go down to the waterfront, and 95% of them do not want ATVs down there. Uh, well aware of the noise impact of ATVs at the waterfront. I was at a resident's house today that lives on the trail. He's concerned. Many residents are concerned. Um, so as far as putting up a barrier goes, you'd have to, what about the residents? What happens to them? Do they get left out in the dark? Uh, you know, we're doing an active living master plan and uh, we're gonna be discussing active living. And you know, the notion of it's either motorized or not, well, the motion got defeated for, to try snowmobiles, so here we are. Uh, the Trans-Canada Trail speaks of uh, motorized, non-motorized in the, in the summer and skidoos in the winter and active living. There's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. Uh, now, ATVs are allowed on municipal roadways. So do the ATVs come, staff has to look into this with the county, do they come down uh, at the Pembroke Mall or down at the Quebec Turnoff and drive into Pembroke and then park at the Patterson lot across the Timber Mural, uh, Mural Timber Raft Mural. These are all things that have to be happened. Do we want ATVs in, on the roads in Pembroke? I've discussed it with some residents. They don't, they don't want it. So, you know, uh, you know, I know they're in Ironbrier, Renfrew, but this is Pembroke. This is our waterfront. Very concerned about having the motorized traffic there. So staff is going to have to come back with some uh, alternatives in the county. And the county says that it's up to us to find an alternate route. But I don't know. That's not a written in law. As the deputy mayor pointed out, we're a single chair municipality. The county has to work with us to find an alternate to make this work. The ATVs want to come into Pembroke. We welcome them, but not in the current state of the waterfront. So there has to be, everything has to be worked out. Do they go on the road to Pembroke? Is that right option? Noise impact study, has that been done? Um, concerns about the dust, but I think we're losing sight also of the active living aspect. We're talking about motorized traffic. Some people feel that they don't, it won't work. So these are some of the concerns I have. Uh, I could go on and on, but uh, the other, other members have voiced their concerns too. So there's more homework that needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, yes, Council Plummer. Yeah, I, I'd certainly like some more information coming back. I, I do acknowledge that uh, there may be economic benefits. There may be instances where this is a, you know, a net benefit to the city. Um, I have also concerns about dust. That's one major concern that I have uh, being kicked up. Uh, we we talked to our uh, neighbor, and they ended up putting a trail beside a trail because they just there was just too much dust. And you, you do see the dust balls rolling down if you drive Petawa Boulevard. People using the trail. Um, so maybe there's interest that we pave the trail through the through the downtown, and then that eliminates dust entirely. So that's just done, um, and that promotes more active living for the Qantas Walkway. We have, we have a walkway that uh, people love to walk, bike and rollerblade and walk and push strollers. Well, if it was paved through the downtown, you get everyone walking on there. That might be an instance in itself. If you don't go up to Petawala on base, they've got a lovely trail that's all paved around the whole base. Um, so there's an instance where we could eliminate one hazard. Uh, we still have noise concerns, yes, but maybe that's just a, a speed issue or a volume control issue that can be ad addressed with uh, the clubs. So I am open to it. I just need to, I'm just not prepared to approve it tonight. Thank you. Councillor Reavy. 
Thank you, Your Worship. Um, some good ideas coming around. I, I think possibly we can find a, um, a compromise at some point. When we talk about speed issues, I just want to remind everybody that snowmobiles are made for speed. ATVs are not. I'm sorry, I'm not going 90 kilometers an hour on my side by side. It just doesn't happen. So, you know, we've just approved a trial period for machines that do go very quickly. Um, my question, I guess, would be to the county when they're looking at penalties um, for whatever issues happening on the trail, if they would be willing or able to take away um, uh, the rider's trail pass. I'm assuming that they do need the passes for the Algonquin Trail like they do for every other trail in Ontario. So um, I think in addition to a very hefty fine that the, if they had the ability to take those passes so that the riders can't uh, ride. So it would be a question I'd have to, uh, to county as we move forward. Hey, Mayor. Uh, thank you. So, uh, yes, it, but it's, uh, and I see uh, Mr. Lapier writing feverishly. It's providing Mr. Lapier with some specifics because, as I recall, in December there was indications of concerns, but without some specifics that staff can come back and address each one particular. I can tell you that staff have some ideas as to what some of the concerns might be for certain uh, counselors. So, for instance, the, the issue uh, of the uh, dust. So that's why I was asking the county rep, and he's talking about dust suppression, meaning calcium chloride. Have I had discussions with our own staff? Yes, uh, you can put down tar and chip, you can pave it, you can do different things to try uh, uh, and address it. And anyways, so that was one of the items. So, and yes, I've had discussions with the county and I've had discussions with our own staff to try and, uh, to try and address those different issues. Um, uh, we, uh, as a council, have received those presentations and have asked the question such as, um, do you have any comments in terms of speed? And as I recall it, the president, at least she was the president then, uh, Ms. Uh, Hebb, uh, was indicating you impose the speed limit and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, you know, we'll address it, we'll sign, put up the appropriate signage and we'll, and we'll do uh, what it is that, uh, because they want to see it succeed. Um, in terms of, uh, so a good point by uh, Councillor Reavy in terms of what uh, can the penalties be. Um, I know Councillor Jackano and myself had a discussion with a staff member today as part of our ordinary uh, meetings with, uh, uh, with the operations department and one of the discussions was uh, concerning um, having uh, individuals appointed as bylaw officers. God knows we already do it for a number of different private property owners. We give them the authority uh, to go ahead and ticket individuals and monitor their own lots and we pass the appropriate bylaw at our council so that we give them the authority to do what is necessary. And so why, as, a, as an exploring an issue, why not uh, if they have a different individuals, trail wardens, whatever you want to call them, uh, giving them the authority that in the confines of our jurisdiction inside the city of Pembroke proper, you were going to give them the authority to lay the fine so that it's not all at the feet of the OPP. So I think there's a lot of great ideas that staff have, but it's being specific enough. Um, so, and all I can say is some of us have been asking different staff members, what about this? Trying to anticipate what might be questions be. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? What's the answer to this? Is there an answer to that? And there's, in my opinion, always a solution to whatever it is. It's just being specific enough so Mr. Lapier says, okay, it's it's dust, it's noise, it's uh, signage, it's whatever. And I meant what I said in back in, apparently back in December is, is that the report, I think staff tried to answer all these different things, but apparently certain uh, questions still linger. And so it's being specific enough. So Mr. Lapier says, okay, point number one, uh, dust control. So there is this suppression, but we can pave it. This is who's responsible for it. And the county has agreed to it or the uh, uh, ATV club has agreed to it, uh, whoever. Um, next point, this is what it is. How can we address it? Next point, what is it and how can we address it? Because, uh, uh, you know, they're all valid concerns. And, and I know that there's a lot of valid concerns. Let's be specific so Mr. Lapier can just pick them off and address them. Okay, so I, and I think that's through to go. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. What, uh, uh, Mr. LaPierre, we will pick a date. So as far as council, could, could we prepare quest specific questions for the CEO and, and pick the date of, let's say, a week, well, 
uh, August the 20th, that we get our questions in and, and to be specific so that it will enable staff enough time to put things together so, so that we as a, a council can make a decision hopefully in October be before winter arrives. Uh, Mr. LaPierre, is that feasible? I totally agree. That's what I was writing down here is okay. for members of uh, committee to provide to me the issues that you would like to see addressed and do it very soon. I was saying within a week. This is like 10 days. Good while it's still fresh. And then staff will take that list and we will come back and say, here's what could be done or, you know, nothing's going to be done about that one. There's nothing you could do or whatever. Because we can't anticipate every issue. Mm -hmm. And there will be some that will come up, you know, if something gets approved, they will come up over time. Then we'll have to work with the county and our neighbours to deal with those. But we'll try and anticipate as many as we can, certainly. And yes, and okay. have, have a report back by October so that some direction and perhaps if, if committees uh, agreeable, make that the date that we're going to get a decision. Yes. Okay. So that we don't continue on forever. Yep. Uh, Councillor Jackano. Your Worship, uh, a number of years ago, when uh, Councillor Brian Adam and a few of the guys were sitting around a campfire at uh, Riverside Park, everybody said, oh, no, we don't want all these trailers in our community. It's going to cause a backlog of traffic. And what are the poor people in our community going to do? How many millions of dollars did a dream that a few people had because they offered other people something to come to? And, you know, I'm hearing the comment, well, they'll just ride right through here. Well, let's offer them something to come to. Offer these snowmobilers, you know, the biggest tournament in North America with a racing perspective. Work it in with the Eganville snowmobilers. Uh, have an ATV uh, competition that's uh, North America wide. The, uh, the fiddling and step dancing competition. And a lot of people were against that to begin with because, well, it was going to disrupt their way of life. It wasn't really going to be good for anybody. It, you look at the dollars that this community has lost because of that committee not operating and not having these step dancing and fiddlers in our community. Uh, millions, multi-millions of dollars, you know, over a course of a number of years will be gone. So by attracting these people here and welcoming them, being a welcoming community, they'll come here because they'll say, well, you know, I feel welcome there. There's a motel where I can stay. They're having the, you know, the annual North American races on the Ottawa River or wherever. But I mean, that's part of economic development. Come up with a plan. I mean, you got, you got multi-millions, you got a billion dollar industry in the province of Ontario Snow dealers driving right by your door. And uh, what did people say? They travel with their wallets. The deputy mayor said that. He said that on a motorized piece of equipment. I know that other members of our staff, you know, our snowmobilers, they know what is being spent. Drive out to the Best Western. So they're not staying at the Best Western. How are they going to get into town? That'll be the logistics that will work out. But the thing is to get them here and to welcome them here. If we all say, you know, uh, cheapers, uh, uh, we have no vision, therefore we have no, uh, you know, we have no progress, and therefore we have no success. So, I mean, if you want people here, you want to encourage uh, something, then let's let's do it. Let's come up with some innovative ideas, and you have the brain power sitting around this table and an excellent staff to do that. What are we waiting for? Okay, Councillor Lafreniere will be the last comment before we move on. Councillor Lafreniere. So we've gone round and round the table. Um, I still like the mayor's idea about an alternate route. Um, I mean, I think that the premier passed a, a bylaw or a legislation that says that ATVs can travel through municipality. They just have to, you know, pa pass a bylaw or ban them if they don't want them there. So maybe we come them, bring them from McKay along Lake out to uh, Trafalgar Road to bypass the waterfront. But unless there's a sound barrier, that's my big obstacle here, is the sound at the waterfront. And it sounds like we're not going to be able to accept snowmobiles if we say no to ATVs. And if it's carte blanche that we have to accept all motorized vehicle on the trail, then I'm not going to be supporting that. 
um, unless there's a sound barrier. Okay, Councillor Fenier, make sure it's a specific question to, for the CEO. All right, uh, thank you very much for the discussion, Council. And we've been at this now for three and a half hours, so we will take a 10 minute break uh, before moving on with item number two of our combined meeting.
Thank you very much, Sean. Okay, so we're back uh, to our meeting. Um, item B, Pembroke and Area Airport Budget. Oh, Councillor Giacchino had up his hand. Oh, sorry, Councillor Giacchino. Your Worship, if it isn't premature, I would like to bring forward a motion uh, for con Council's consideration uh, that we consider both types of uh, skidoos and motorized vehicles to go through our community uh, with the uh, caveat that uh, we look at buffering the area and soundproofing the area uh, at the waterfront from the waterfront part from perhaps Algonquin uh, Way to uh, beyond Supple's Landing. Most seconded by uh, Deputy Mayor. So there's a motion on the floor to uh, for motorized traffic. Do you have any comments, uh, Deputy Mayor? I don't know if the, the mover does. Uh, if I understand the, uh, through your, your worship, if I understand the motion correctly, it's for both uh, types of motorized use, uh, but I believe what uh, Councillor Giacchino is, is uh, indicating is that uh, um, when he says the caveat, I think I would normally say with direction to staff uh, to uh, work out the issue of the, uh, the, the buffering, hence noise issue. Is, I don't know if I'm correct on that. But. Councillor Giacchino, is that correct? Uh, proper terminology, as the Deputy Mayor said, yes, I concur with that. Okay, thank you. Are there any comments? We've discussed this long enough, and uh, Councillor Abdallah. Well, didn't we just take a break? And before the break, we discussed to have questions within a week delivered to the CAO, Mr. Lapierre. And now we come back from break, and we have a motion about the noise barrier. I don't see the purpose of the motion at this time. This is a motion that could wait until all the councillors have had their questions directed to Mr. Lapier, and then he comes back with some answers as, after he sat down with the county officials to work it out. So that's that's my concern. Thank you, Councillor Plummer. I would motion to table this item until a councillor's questions have been answered. Motion to table. I'll second that. Okay. So therefore, motion to table takes precedence. So you need uh, no debate on it, but you have. A decision to make now with respect to the motion to table as opposed to the main motion which would come if this isn't tabled. So motion to table, yes. Uh, Deputy Mayor. The point of order is all council members present at the present moment. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We just went off video, yeah. I think. Yeah. So we require So motion to table, so you need to, to call the vote. Okay. All those in favor of motion to table. Carried. Thank you. Uh, point of order? Be, yes. Oh. A point of order. Um, so this still stands that we have within a week to put questions about the possibility of both motorized on the trail to Mr. Lapierre. Th that direction has not changed. Okay. No, that yeah. still stands. Thank this, you. This motion stays on the table. Could be forever. Or could be could. until uh, council members want to bring it back. Thank you. All right, item B, the Pemberton Area Airport budget. Mr. LaPierre. Okay. So the Pemberton Area Airport Commission is seeking approval for their 2021 budget. Uh, they are required to submit their annual budget for the approval of each council as per the Joint Ownership Management and Funding Agreement. Uh, the 2021 budget you have provided uh, in your packages. So the city's share is $19,111.65. So as compared with the city's 2021 budget of 22,000. So this was approved in your 2021 budget. Uh, what happened here is that uh, a report is normally submitted to committee in late May, but it was misfiled and nobody raised it, including the airport commission, but it has to be uh, it has to be approved on a technical basis. Councillor Plummer, I would move we approve the report. Moved by Councillor Plummer, second by Councillor Reeby. All those in favor? Motion carried. Thank you. Rescue of animals and motor vehicles is Chief Sellion. Yes, there he is, Chief. 
Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Your Worship. Uh, I'd just like to uh, start to say that uh, it's an honour to uh, be here presenting to uh, Council for the first time as uh, Chief, and uh, I am excited, and uh, just thank you very much for the opportunity. So it's recommended that bylaw 2020-71, uh, the establishing and regulating bylaw uh, for the City of Pembroke Fire Department, be amended by adding rescue of domestic animals in motor vehicles to Appendix B. Uh, on July 8, 2021, heads of council throughout Ontario received a letter from the Solicitor General outlining the dangers of leaving animals in unattended vehicles. In this letter, the Solicitor General outlined the role the general public can play in keeping animals safe and asked anyone who sees animals in distress in motor vehicles to call 911 immediately. The letter further outlined the role fire departments can play in providing rescue to these distressed animals. The Fire Protection and Prevention Act already provides authority to the fire services to enter and perform rescue. In order for the Pembroke Fire Department to provide this service, the Council is required to amend our establishing and regulating bylaw to allow us to perform these rescues. Uh, there are no financial implications to this recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Councillor Reedy. Thank you, Your Worship. I would move that we amend bylaw 2020-71 as recommended. Moved by Councillor Reedy, seconded by Councillor Plummer. All those in favor? Carried. Thank you. 576 Melton Street, transfer of ownership. The Deputy Mayor has declared a conflict. Uh, Mrs. Sorial. Good evening. So a severance application was recently received and approved by the Planning Advisory and Adjustment Committee for the property municipally known as 576 Melton. So severances were approved in 2018 so that a developer could develop phase two of the Sydenham plan of subdivision into four large lots instead of the approved 14 lots. The present applicant has recently purchased uh, 576 Melton Street and would like to sever this lot to create another lot for a single detached dwelling house. As part of the 2018 severance application, there was a development agreement that was approved by Council between the City and 577785 Ontario Limited. And this agreement said that the owner will transfer to the City land adjacent to Melton Street, which is about 18.5 metres by 6 metres in size, for the purposes of keeping city infrastructure on city property. And the infrastructure included sanitary service, manhole, fire hydrant, et cetera. And that was to be on parts 38 and 39 on reference plan 19421. However, when bylaw 2019-50, which was the bylaw to close up and stop up a portion of Sydenham Street was passed, it didn't include part 39 being transferred to the city, and this part remained unknowingly in the ownership of 577785 Ontario Limited. So this company then sold 576 Melton Street to 135369 Ontario Limited, and the issue of ownership came to light when the new owner submitted a severance application. So the severance application was approved by the Planning Advisory and Adjustment Committee on July 28th with the following conditions that the severed lot meet the condition of the development agreement, which states that the previous owner or any subsequent owner must grant ownership of part 39 to the city of Pembroke for the purposes of keeping city infrastructure on city land. Secondly, once ownership of part 39 is transferred to the city, the city agrees to grant an easement to the owner of 576 Melton Street for the purposes of parking and access for 576 Melton. The operations department has reviewed this request and is in agreement that an easement for the purposes of parking and access for this property is acceptable. The city solicitor has confirmed that the new owner has signed documents consenting to the transfer of ownership of part 39. A bylaw has been prepared for this evening uh, for council authorizing the transfer of land and the provision for an easement for parking and access for the purposes of 576 uh, Melton Street. There are no financial implications to the city. The legal fees will be paid by the owner of 576 Melton Street. So the planning department of the business department is recommending this. 
Okay, are there any questions from council? The bylaw will be before us this evening. No questions, thank you. Um, community Improvement Program Application, 10 Primberg Street West, Mississauga. Okay, so on July 28th, uh, we received a completed Community Improvement Plan application from Michael Murphy, owner of 10 Pembroke Street West. Uh, the application is for the Downtown Heritage Facade Improvement Grant and the Accessibility Grant. So the uh, applicant is proposing to refinish the exterior in a gray brick veneer with new windows and doors, new LED exterior lights, and the front door will be, an autom will be automatic to meet the uh, requirements of the AODA as well as accessible um, access to the new sidewalk has already been completed. According to the Community Improvement Plan requirements, there can be no outstanding taxes or outstanding work orders, and there is no concerns in this regard. We received uh, two quotes for all the work. However, the same contractor has been provided uh, the quotes for the work, but the quotes are very different due to the materials being used on the facade. The applicant has found it very difficult to get quotes from a second contractor. The materials being used are over $25,000 each, and thus the maximum amount of the grant can be attained by just using the materials only. Two quotes have been received for the materials. Two quotes have also been received for the supply and installation of an accessible door under the accessibility grant. Uh, we have received one quote for the concrete work for the accessible sidewalk. And according to the applicant, $5,600 was paid to Greenwood Paving for accessible sidewalk from the parking lot. The lowest quote for the supply and installation for the accessible commercial door was $2,200. So therefore, according to the low quote provided, the facade improvements will cost $44,160. Based on the Heritage Facade Improvement Grant, 50% of the work can be reimbursed up to $5,000. And if the application is approved, the whole $5,000 can be awarded. Under the accessibility grant, 50% of the work can be reimbursed up to a maximum of $2,500. The quote provided indicates that the improvements to accessibility for the building total $7,800. However, again, there was only one quote for the um, accessible access to the new sidewalk. However, the CIP panel felt that this um, uh, the applicant would have received the best possible price and was satisfied with the one quote. So therefore, this application is um, eligible for a total of $7,500 under the Community Improvement Plan. This will be before our resolution will be before Council at tonight's meeting. Are there any comments? This resolution before Council? None. Thank you. Uh, Community Improvement Grant 159 Pembroke Street West, Mrs. Sorial. So we received a, an application uh, for 159 Pembroke Street West from the owner of the property, Ivan Denter. The application is for the Downtown Heritage Facade Improvement Grant, Accessibility Grant, and the Planning and Building Permit Fee Grant. The applicant also applied for the Tax Increment Equivalent Grant, but was told he couldn't combine this grant with any other grant, so he proceeded with the three above grants. The work for 159 includes um, new commercial windows with full height glass with a grid pattern to emulate the heritage look and a new accessible door. So again, the quote, two quotes were received um, and um, the according to the lowest quote for the facade improvement, which was $17,250, um, he's eligible for up to $5,000. And based on the quotes, uh, he would, if, uh, if approved, would receive the full $5,000. And according to the low quote of uh, $2,300 for the accessibility improvements at 159 Pembroke Street West, uh, he could be reimbursed up to a maximum of $2,500. However, um, because it's 50% of the eligible cost, he would be eligible for $1,150. And under the planning and building permit fee, the total fees can be reimbursed as they relate to the work being applied for. So he has a building permit on this property in the amount of $1,197. However, according to Mark Schultz, our chief building official, only 15% of that building permit can be attributed to the facade 
Therefore, he would be eligible for a grant of $179.63. So in total, the applicant would be eligible for $6,329.63 under the Community Improvement Plan. And just to keep the committee um, in uh, aware of what's going on, in uh, 2021, there is still $13,712 of unallocated funds remaining in the CIP budget. However, if both 10 Pembroke Street West and 159 Pembroke Street West are approved, then there would be a deficit of $117.63. But there is a, a reserve, a CIP reserve, and in that is reserve, we have over 68,000, just over $68,000. In regards to COVID-19 grants, $35,000 has been budgeted in 2021, uh, $12,000 has been paid out, an additional $8,500 has been committed for 2020 and 2021, and we still have uh, 14000 just a little over $14,000 remains uncommitted. And there is a resolution before Council for 159 Pembroke Street West. Thank you. Any comments or questions? This will be before council again this evening. Uh, the pedestrian crossing presentation, Ms. McLaughlin. Thank you, Your Worship. This report is for information purposes only. The city, through various capital projects, have completed significant enhancements to our traffic signal lights and pedestrian crossings at various locations in the city. Additional enhancements on Pembroke Street West as part of the ICIP funded reconstruction are to be completed in the coming years. The following presentation will provide an overview of these enhancements and information for both pedestrians and drivers on their features to assist them in safely using them. There are no financial impacts associated with this report. Okay, thank you. Any questions? I have one. You know, in regards to some of uh, a couple of the crossings, we have the huge X on the pavement, and at other ones we don't have. Is there any reason why we don't have that large X? at all of the crossings through you, your worship yes. um some of the standards regarding line painting um yep. have changed over the years and we've gone to the the triangle painting oh. at, at these i will share my screen now and start the presentation okay thank you everyone can see the screen yes over the past years, through various capital projects, the city has completed significant enhancements to some of our traffic signal lights and pedestrian crossings. This presentation will highlight some of these enhancements and review the rules of the road when it comes to safety for both pedestrians and drivers. These enhancements have included the installation of countdown timers, these provide pedestrians with the number of seconds remaining to safely cross the street. Audible signals. Pedestrians will hear one of four typical audible tones. A constant tick tick is the push button locator tone that provides an audible sign that a push button is required to request the walk signal. Uh, a cuckoo is an audible tone when the walk light is on for north south, south pedestrian crossing. And a bird chirp chirp is an audible tone for when the walk light is on for east west pedestrian crossing. And a please wait. This is heard once the button has been pushed and is confirmation that it has been activated. Advanced left turning. Select intersections have had the installation of detector loops in the left turn lanes. The advanced arrows are only activated when the loops detect a vehicle in the turning lane. The arrow remains active until no more vehicles are detected or for a predetermined length of time, whichever comes first. Tactile warning surface indicators or twizzies are standardized walking surfaces that convey information to pedestrians impacted by blindness through texture. They are meant to function as a stop sign to alert visually impaired pedestrians to the presence of hazards in the line of travel and LED lights. These are more visible than traditional incandescent bulbs and increase the overall safety for all roadway users. Pedestrian crossovers, uh, known as PXOs, are designated crosswalks that allow pedestrians to safely cross roads where there are no traffic signals. They are equipped with overhead yellow lights that warn drivers and cyclists 
that pedestrians will be crossing. Drivers and cyclists must yield the right of way to pedestrians in the crossover. And cyclists must dismount their bike when using the crosswalk. Intersection, pedestrian signals, IPSs, are pedestrian crossings that are located at intersections with traffic lights. These have one or more crosswalks, a pedestrian walk and don't walk signal, and push buttons for pedestrians. The signal for pedestrians to walk is a white walking symbol, and a flashing or steady orange hand symbol means pedestrians must not begin to cross. While crossing, the pedestrian has the right of way over all vehicles. And did you know that as, as of January 1st, 2016, drivers and cyclists in both directions must wait until pedestrians have completely cleared the entire roadway at pedestrian crossings before moving forward. This means you can't just wait until the pedestrians have cleared out of your lane to continue driving. You must wait until they have fully reached the other side of the road. Failure to do so could mean fines ranging from $150 to $500 and three demerit points. These fines are doubled in community safety zones, which can be found near schools and public areas. This rule does not apply to pedestrian crossings at intersections with traffic lights or at stop signs. It is not recommended that pedestrians cross mid-block at uncontrolled locations where drivers are not expecting to encounter pedestrians. It is safer to cross the street at traffic signals, crosswalks, or at intersections with stop signs. So some pedestrian safety tips. Push the button. To activate the overhead flashing amber lights to warn approaching traffic that a crossover is about to be used. Stop, look, and listen. Look left, right, and then left before starting to cross to ensure that vehicles have stopped. Keep looking as you cross the street. Walk and proceed with caution. Once you have begun your crossing, look ahead and ensure your lane is safe to cross. Large vehicles may block you from being seen by drivers in other lanes. Be aware, make eye contact with drivers before you step into a crosswalk. Make sure they see you, plan on stopping and have time to stop. Don't assume because one car has stopped, the other cars will stop too. And don't delay, use care and caution when crossing, but proceed promptly, avoid distractions such as texting while crossing the road, and be courteous. Don't stand near or at a crossing unless you intend to use it. Drivers could break unexpectedly thinking a pedestrian is intending to cross, leading to potential, potential collisions. Driver safety tips. Be alert. Use extra caution when approaching a crosswalk. Watch for the flashing amber lights and pedestrians standing at the side of the road. Stop. Drivers must obey the flashing lights and yield the right of way to pedestrians within a crosswalk. Always come to a full stop at intersections when pedestrians are using the crosswalk. Be safe. Operate your vehicle in a crossover area at a speed that will allow you to stop safely when the crosswalk is activated. And be patient. Winter weather, older adults, young children, and those with limited mobility may reduce a person's crossing speed. Give pedestrians the time to cross safely and comfortably. And be courteous, watch for children, drive slowly and cautiously through school zones and residential areas. As part of a number of capital projects, the following intersections have had enhancements completed at, to the traffic signals. Pembroke Street East at Howard Street, Pembroke Street East at Cecilia Street, Pembroke Street East at McKay Street, Pembroke Street West at Victoria Street, Pembroke Street West at Blakely Crescent, McKay Street at Alfred Street, River Road, Town Line Road, Paul Martin Drive, and Boundary Road. As part of the Pembroke Street West reconstruction phase two, the traffic signals at Pembroke Street West and Crandall, as well as the Pembroke Street West and Riverside, will see enhancements installed. As part of the capital projects, the following crossovers have had enhancements. Pembroke Street East at Elizabeth Street, Pembroke Street West at William Street, and that is a new install to replace the former Pembroke Street East and Maple Crossing. Angus Campbell Drive at the Pembroke Mall, Bell Street at Fellows High School. The city is working towards future upgrades of the remaining traffic singles and pedestrian crossovers across the city as part of various future capital projects. Thank you and stay safe. Thank you for the presentation. Are there any comments or questions for Ms. McLaughlin? Councillor Reeve. 
Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Marielle, for a most excellent uh, um, presentation. I know that um, we discussed a lot of these places where the en enhancements have taken place when we did our accessibility advisory um, committee walkthrough. So there are going to be some very happy people on that committee for sure. But it does make a big difference in our city. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Abdallah. Uh, thanks, Mary Ellen, for the presentation. I, it's, it's really uh, good to see that improved safety enhancements in the city and that we're getting the funds from the province and, and we're paying for some of the costs too. And, uh, you know, I see the crosswalk at the Pembroke Mall and I've had many comments about that and how great that is and, and all the uh, safety, the left turns on Alfred Street and McKay and over here at the post office. So. Hats off to the city staff for going after the grants and uh, implementing those changes. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Plummer. Uh, just a comment. Um, I, I do realize that the left turn lanes are, were a well needed uh, addition to uh, Pembroke. Uh, any, any options for, say, speeding them up or chalking, but certainly the, the intersection at uh, Pembroke Street and uh, McKay seems to be quite the backlog of traffic some days, um, backed up all the way even blocking down to Victoria Street. Um, is there a way of uh, the city adjusting the timing a little bit? Because as you say, they go for a predetermined time or until they read. Um, basically no one there. I'm just seeing on busy rush hours, you know, we used to have no lights. People would uh, just go through cars, I guess, in the yellow afterwards and then have to wait a little bit. But I know that's not the best course of action, but now we ha do have the green lights, green go-aheads. Is there a way of adjusting those times? Uh, through you, Your Worship. Yep. Um, I have spoken with um, our representative at Partham who has installed the lights, and he has confirmed that we can alter the timing of some of the lights if we're finding that they're um, not working and backing up traffic too much. Okay, good. Any other questions or comments? Thank you very much, Ms. McLaughlin. Next item, engineering service for citywide flood risk assessment. Mr. Lewis. Thank you, Your Worship. The Operations Department recommends the following. Committee approve award for engineering services for citywide flood risk assessment and storm outfall review. Request for proposal number P-21-09 to Aqua 4 Beach Limited in the amount of $307,870. Committee approve additional expenditures in the amount of $80,000 for contingency allowance and provisional items. Total value of the recommendations equal $387,870 plus applicable HST. The RFP was publicly advertised, closed on July 6th of 2021 with two proposals being received. Proposals were reviewed and evaluated by the Supervisor of Capital Works and the Supervisor of Water Distribution and Wastewater Collection. All scoring was done individually, and the review and compiling of scoring was monitored by the Deputy Treasurer and myself, the Manager of Operations. Proposals were reviewed and evaluated in accordance with predetermined criteria, and that criteria is noted in the report. The recommendation for award was derived by using the highest score based on the average of the evaluators as per the attached proposal evaluation matrix. Based on the review, the Evaluation Committee believes the Aquaphor Beach Limited proposal offers the best value for the project. The City was successful in its application for funding under the sixth intake of the National Disaster Mitigation Program, also called NDMP, Stream 1 risk assessments with a maximum federal contribution of 50%. Additional expenditures that are included in staff's recommendation are for provisional items for a climate change scenario, field data collection, and archaeological screening stage one assessment, as well as for additional reviews of areas of concern based on the extreme weather that was experienced July 13th of this year. On May 18th of this year, committee approved the use of $250,000 from the Moffat Street Storm Sewer Outlet 27 project for the city's portion of flood risk assessment and out outfall review. Based on staff's recommendation for award, the city's cost will be excuse me, the city's cost for this project will be just under 194,000 plus applicable HST with matching federal funds. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. Council? Councilor Abdalla. Motion to accept staff's recommendation to award the contract to Aquaphor Beach Limited in the amount of 307,000 
$870 plus the $80,000 contingency allowance, total value $387,000. $387,870 plus applicable HST. Seconded by Councillor Plummer. Yes, Councillor Plummer. And I have a comment to uh, Mr. Lewis. Um, you know, just uh, scanning this over, see engineering services to provide citywide flood risk assessment and outfall. So what, I guess, a question to you, what are we really getting for that? I know we're going to assess everything and kind of, I guess, come up with a plan, but I just want to make sure, like, what are we getting? Uh, maybe explain a little bit more of uh, a quick review of what are we actually getting for this 100 and, or 300, I guess now it's $387,000 and change. Through your worship, um, the citywide risk assessment is gonna give us a, a study of some of the, what we call pinch points, some of the areas that we are, are aware we have some concerns with our underground storm sewer, Angus Camel Drive, for example, uh, where we had some damage to the, the asphalt and the roadway at the last storm on July 13th. Um, they're going to do a study of all the incoming pipes and the outgoing pipes to ensure that they're either big enough or to determine what size and, and uh, um, storm confi conveyance needs to be done to get rid of some of those areas of concern. So that's the citywide risk assessment. It's... Um, as it states, it's citywide, but we're going to get them to concentrate on some of the big areas that we uh, we know we have some issues with. The outfall review, there's a number of storm sewer outfalls that we've got some concerns with. They're going to review those, provide recommendations on rehabilitation, as well as provide design drawings ready for tender on a number of our outfalls. So that'll provide us with a, a go forward plan that we can start tendering for those rehabilitations in the near future. All those in favor of the motion, carried, thank you. Access to and maintenance of Miller Street pedestrian bridge, Mr. Lewis. Thank you, Your Worship. The Operations Department is seeking direction from committee on continuing access to and maintenance of the pedestrian bridge at the bottom of the Miller Street Hill. The pedestrian bridge at the east end of Miller Street mainly services the students of Bishop Smith Catholic High School and it may serve pedestrians from the neighborhoods budding Everett Street area. Heavy rainfall events, uh, which we all know are, are becoming more and more frequent and more severe, caused the gravel hill off of Mary Street, as well as the Miller Street Hill to wash out, causing severe erosion and potential, potentially dangerous conditions. Road crews attend to this location on an average seven times a year with staff, equipment and materials to remediate the erosion. During the winter months, the gravel hills are maintained for both vehicular and pedestrian travel by in-house staff, and the pedestrian bridge is maintained by hand shoveling and hand sanding under contract. We use the contract work due to the danger associated with not completing it regularly, and we're, as we're all aware, city forces are required on the public streets and sidewalks during winter ev events. It's worth noting that the city has been sued at least once in the past related to this particular location. The pedestrian bridge requires biennial inspections by a structural engineer and continued maintenance. Most recently, the entire railings were replaced as they had been damaged and were ineffective. The area at the base of the two hills is prone to flooding during spring high water, and the department closes the roads to all traffic during those flood events. So a number of options have been put together by staff at the operations department. Those options are option one, close the Miller Street Hill the gravel hill, the pedestrian bridge, with an annual savings of approximately 17,200. Annual savings include about 3,200 for winter maintenance of Miller Street Hill and the gravel hill, roughly 4,000 for winter maintenance of the pedestrian bridge, and approximate annual savings of $10,000 for the erosion maintenance. There may be some legal and survey fees related to stop up and close of those roads. <clears throat> Option number two, close the gravel hill to vehicles, install a pedestrian path on that gravel hill and a cul-de-sac at the bottom of Miller Street, an approximate cost of $30,000. I have provided a, a sketch as part of the report that shows the, uh, the pedestrian pathway 
and the cul-de-sac to help uh, clarify the intent of this option. This option still includes the stop up and close of the gravel hill between Miller Street and Mary Street, the construction of an asphalt pedestrian path on the west side of the existing road with accommodation for drainage, construct parking spaces for bereavement park off of Mary Street, and create a granular cul-de-sac at the base of Miller Street so that traffic on Miller Street coming down to the hill could turn around and go back up Miller Street. Construction costs associated with the option are approximately $30,000. Again, there may still be some fees related to the stop up and close of the road. When considering this option, committee would still need to consider whether winter maintenance would continue or if the pedestrian path, the bridge and the road to the bottom of Miller Street would be closed for the winter. There's a minimum savings of approximately $6,000 to $8,000 annually um, as the erosion would no longer be a major, major issue with additional savings if no winter maintenance was required in the seasonal closure. Option number three, both roads remain open, no winter maintenance and would see an annual savings of approximately $7,200 uh, based on an average of the past winter seasons. Operation staff would barricade and close the roads during the winter months and open spring through fall. The erosion issues would continue and would need to be remediated annually with an average cost of about $10,000. As always, there's the option to do nothing, which is option number four, and continues the annual average cost of roughly $17,200 for winter maintenance and erosion remediation in this area. If directed, the Operations Department will make contact with the Renfrew County Catholic District School Board to discuss the preferred option, as there may be an opportunity for winter maintenance to be undertaken by the School Board. The Operations Department will welcome comments and input from the community and stakeholders prior to any actions based on the direction of the committee. The financial implications are solely dependent on the option chosen, and I have detailed those in the report. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. Councillor Abdalla. I have a question that I'd, I'd like to put a motion on the floor if possible. Uh, through you, Your Worship, Mr. Lewis, the uh, city was sued. Can you comment on the, was, was that in the winter time? And can you comment on the over, over what you can, can you comment on the overall liability of the uh, bridge and the way it stands? Liability risk for the city? Uh, through your worship, uh, the issue with the, um, the lawsuit that uh, was brought against the city was a winter related issue, if I remember correctly. Um, I can't get into the details of it at this point, but yes, it was related to winter control activities. The other liabilities that, uh, that persist down in that area is the erosion. So if we get a two o'clock in the morning heavy thunderstorm like we've been seeing a lot lately, we're gonna end up with severe erosion down both the gravel portions of that road. And should a vehicle go down there early in the morning before we have an opportunity to go attend to that, um, there could be liability with, you know, vehicle accident or a vehicle turnover or something of that nature. When we do have those severe storms and, and we are aware of severe erosion, our first response, of course, is to our bridges, where our main traffic is. Then we look at our outfalls and outlets, some of those areas that are prone to erosion that could create a severe loss or a landslide or those type of things. So we don't always get to uh, the erosion on the Miller Street here, hill or the gravel hill immediately. So that does present some, some liable, liability. Thank you. So I've, I've read the report and uh I'd like to motion that the committee accepts option number two of the manager of operations options with the addition of not maintaining the gravel hill and pedestrian path during winter months and closing the pedestrian bridge for winter months. So we, we accept option two, which says install pedestrian path, cul-de-sac, and we we add to it, we do not maintain gravel hill and pedestrian path during the winter months and closing the pedestrian bridge for the winter months. Motion moved by Councillor Plummer. Is there a seconder? No, moved by. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Councillor Abdallah, is there a seconder? Councillor Lafreniere? 
Seconded. Comments? Councillor Plummer? Um, so I guess maybe I'm a little confused on the motion a little bit. You, uh, I'm, you, so you're, you're saying you're, you want to, option two, so you want to construct a cul-de-sac with a pedestrian pathway, but then not maintain it in the winter? Is that what you're saying at the motion? I just need more, like, wh what are we doing here? That's correct. Uh, except option number two, with the addition of not maintaining the gravel hill and pedestrian path during the winter months and closing the bridge for the winter. That's where the liability is. Okay, I, I would have a different opinion. I'll just state I wouldn't support that particular motion. I would personally be more in support of just closing the gravel hill entirely because it, were, it just seems like there's nothing but in a, a cost there and more focus on actually using Miller Street and come back with the operation manager to decide how we could benefit just using Miller because there already is asphalt three quarters of the way down on Miller Street. So could we just maybe extend that, build our cul-de-sac, and then that would be our access and just completely close off the maintenance issue of the, the gravel hill seems to be where the most of the issues are happening. Other comments, Deputy Mayor? Thank you, Your Worship. Yeah, I, I don't support the the particular motion because if I understand what it's being said is correctly, is we're going to continue to maintain the Miller Street road down to a cul-de-sac, which will, I think, encourage children, whether you're maintaining the bridge or not, and you can close it all you want, but I think they're still going to congregate down there. I think that Miller Street needs to be uh, continually maintained and kept open simply because uh, I know that activities go on down there and the OPP go down there to deal with the activities. So I think that needs to continue. Um, so if you're maintaining the road down, the kids go down, um, you're not wanting, you're closing, I'm not too sure what the closing part is, is just telling them it's roped off or something, but, uh, or you're just not going to maintain the bridge across, but the kids are still going to go down there. Um, so I, I don't support that part. In terms of the Mary Street Hill, yes, if anyone's driven by and, and looked at it and so forth after a rain event, and it doesn't even have to be a huge rain event, uh, you see that uh, huge rutting and so forth, and it, it, it's an issue. Uh, so I certainly support closing of that hill. Uh, it's a matter of what you do with it. I'm aware of many children, because when I travel down Mary Street, many children uh, walking down the, uh, uh, the rutted uh, Mary Street hill, if I can call it that. Uh, so I, I don't have any issue with you know, paving and, and uh, uh, creating a, a, a formal area uh, and letting everything else grow in or whatever. Uh, uh, I know that I've talked to staff about, uh, uh, with Councillor Jack, I know about uh, different things that can be done to ensure that it uh, helps prevent erosion and so forth. So I still think there needs to be ch uh, access for children to go down that way, but I don't support the, the, the current motion just because of all those issues. Other comments? Uh, sorry, Councillor Giacono. Uh, Your Worship, I, I will not be able to support the motion. And uh, I mean, it's got some good points, but uh, if, if you uh, do not have an access for the children that are coming from, let's say, the Maple Street area or Maple Avenue or Center Street, a lot of young people walk and they use that, uh, you know, they go down the Mary Street uh, Hill, and uh, I, I'm in favor of closing that Mary Street Hill, having a small uh, walkway for the students, because if you close that entirely, I mean, anybody living on Center Street's gotta walk all the way down, you know, or even in the summer or spring months, they got a bicycle down to Falgar, and then on to Carmody. I mean, that's, that's quite a detour in there in their daily lives. And I think it's even long enough if you're hiking from the Center Street area and using the, uh, you know, the, the bridge over the river. Uh, I truly believe that, uh, you know, the Mary Street Hill uh, should be um, should be closed off, uh, planted with material that will grow in or whatever, and have that pathway for students and maintain it. Have the, have the cul-de-sac coming from Miller Street uh, I believe many parents drop their children there at the bottom of the hill rather than facing, you know, the traffic issues on Carmody Street. 
and that may leave some uh, leave some of the traffic that is uh, taking place in Carpenter Street. So, on those principles, I cannot support the motion. Councillor Lafreniere. So basically, I support the motion with the amendment that it be maintained, because that's basically what I'm hearing here is that, and I agree, the gravel road down the hill, I mean, I've, I've taken the bridge, the pedestrian bridge, and walked up that hill myself in a shortcut, because I do live in that area, um, uh, just up from Everett Street. So I'm saying the motion, the only thing that needs to change, really, is the maintenance issue. Um, I don't know what the issue is that Deputy Mayor found with option two, because the police could still patrol down there. There would still be children gathering, exactly, and they could still the police could still access through Miller Street. So I think option two is the best, as long as we maintain it. But then the, the another option down below is we could talk to the Renfrew County Catholic District School Board to see if they could share the maintenance of the uh, bridge or the snow removal or something of that nature. So option two with winter maintenance and the option to discuss with the school board. Any other? Yes, Councillor Reby. I agree with option two with the winter maintenance because those kids are going to use that bridge for sure, whether it's snow up to their wastes or not um, but I think we also need to explore any um, help that we might get from the school board because it's in their best interest thank you and so, oh, I'm sorry I can amend the motion to just yeah sure yeah. so I'll amend the motion and uh, that we just I'll thank you we'll just accept option two with uh, talks with the school board about sharing some costs all right, so the motion is amended. Councillor uh, Giacomo. Uh, question to the motion, Your Worship. I'm a little confused here now. So we are going to have the Mary Street Hill continue to be open with the erosion problems we've been facing and also allow, well, I think, wasn't that, I thought, am I confused? Our Councillor Abdella, are you saying to leave both roadways open or to close no. the Mary's Hill? No, option two says to close Gravel Hill, the one off of Mary Street, to vehicles, install a pedestrian path and cul-de-sac. And at the bottom it says, anticipated as uh, savings of $68,000 annually could be anticipated as erosion would no longer be a major issue. So it's what you read there in your report, uh, Councillor Jackano. Okay, so it's it's option two, but also with contact with the separate school board to speaking to yeah, them to share some of the costs. That's right, Councillor Plummer. Uh, just one question. Just looking at our our map here, um, I don't know if Mr. Lewis has an answer for this one, but I'm seeing lot number three four two and three eight six one three five nine. Are those buildable lots or are they not? Um, just if we stop up and close a road, you basically cut that person off of any access to doing something with that lot. I'm just concerned that, um, can you do that? Or I'm not sure what's going on with those lots there. Through your worship, those are city owned properties. And the city acquired those properties due to uh, some issues with the infrastructure. So there is no infrastructure in, in the area for those lots to be buildable. So the amended motion is on the floor. Any other comments? <clears throat> okay, motion on the floor. Uh, I, Councillor Jackano? Could we reread the motion just so I'm exactly <clears throat> clear? I hate to yep. delay the part. Could I have the motion reread, please? Yes. With the amendment. Okay, the motion is to accept option number two with the winter maintenance and direct the, the director of uh, operations, manager of operations, to enter into discussions with the Renfrew County Catholic School Board for the possibility of sharing some of the maintenance costs in the winter. I, I don't hear anything about the roadways. I, I want that to be particularly clear. I don't hear anything in that well, motion about Mary Street Hill or the Miller Street Hill. 
Well, it says in, in under option two, close gravel hill to vehicles, install a pedestrian path and cul-de-sac, $30,000 estimated cost, which will be recovered in a few years by the savings. The sketch is attached. Pursue the st item, bullet number two, pursue the stop up and close of the gravel hill between Miller Street and Mary Street with the construction of an asphalt pedestrian path on the west side of the existing road. Parking spaces for the bereavement park and a granular cul-de-sac at the base of the hill. All right. All those in favor of the motion. Those carried. Uh, investing in Canada Infrastructure Program, Green Stream 2. Mr. Lewis. Thank you, Your Worship. The Operations Department is seeking direction from committee on the submission of an application for the Investing in Canada Infra Infrastructure Program, ICIP Green, uh, intake number two. ICIP is the Federal Provincial Infrastructure Program combining 40% federal funding, 33.33% provincial funding, and municipal funding of 26.67% for critical local and regional infrastructure needs. The ICIP Green Stream second intake prioritize, prioritizes only drinking water projects that address critical health and safety issues associated with water infrastructure. This is much different than the first intake where wastewater projects were also considered and the first intake is where the city had unsuccessfully applied for the town line road sanitary um, force main project. Up to $260 million in federal and provincial funding is available for approximately 400 eligible municipalities under this intake. To be eligible for this particular intake, municipalities must have a population of under 100,000 Project total cost must be less than 5 million and must meet the federally determined project outcome of an increase in access to potable water. Staff have reviewed the existing 10 year multi year capital construction forecast and the water rate study for potential eligible projects. And we've reviewed those projects to determine which may have the greatest chance of success in the funding application review and the following priority eligible project has been identified. The Bennett Street Boundary Road Water Main and Bridge Crossing. The project scope includes the reconstruction of Water Main on Bennett Street from Everett to International Drive. That's the project that we have previously designed. We tendered it, uh, closed um, much higher than the budget was allowed uh, that we had available. Um, so that part would be back into this application for funding. We'd also include the reconstruction and the extension of water main on Boundary Road from Bennett Street to the existing water main east of the Muskrat River near Paul Martin Drive. And the installation of a new water main crossing the Taylor Bridge on Boundary Road over the Muskrat River. The planned International Drive water main upsizing project between Paul Martin Drive and Upper Valley Drive becomes less critical and can be deferred with the installation of a new crossing over the Muskrat River. The concern of the eventual failure of the Herbert Welland water main crossing, which is presently under the Muskrat River, becomes less of an urgency to remediate when the Taylor Bridge crossing, uh, excuse me, with the Taylor Bridge crossing and may eliminate the need for the river crossing altogether. Although that would have to be confirmed with the ongoing water modeling the city is doing of the distribution system. <clears throat> excuse me. Total project costs, including design, construction, field and contract administration with a contingency allowance are in the order of 4.1 million. Financial implications, there are no immediate financial implication at this time for the application. If the city was successful in securing funding, the project would be phased over two years with the budget allocations of 650,000 in 2022 and 450,000 in the 2023 capital budget, and that being the city's share 26.67% of the phased costs. The operations department, uh, sorry, jumped into the next report. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. <clears throat> Council, uh, Councillor Plummer. I think this is a great uh, opportunity uh, to apply for funding from the uh, 
from the government, uh, from the higher levels of government. So I would be in support of the recommendation. Moved by Councillor Plummer, seconded by Councillor Reeby. Any other comments? All those in favor? Carried. Thank you. Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program, COVID-19 Resilience Infrastructure. Thank you, Your Worship. The Operations Department recommends that committee accept the attached transfer payment agreement regarding investing in Canada Infrastructure Program, ICEP COVID-19 Resilience Infrastructure Stream for municipalities for the Boundary Road Pedestrian Path Construction. In December of 2020, Council authorized staff to submit an application for this particular program. The project is to construct an asphalt pedestrian pathway around the former rail trestle crossing Boundary Road and includes lighting and a retaining wall. Total project value is approximately 200,000 with ISIP funding of 166,210. That 166,000 includes 80% federal and 20% provincial funding and the city's funding being $33,790. Finalize the funding in the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program, the city must enter into a transfer payment agreement with the province and a copy is attached. Financial implications, as noted, the city will receive a maximum of 166,210 and is required to fund 100% of all costs exceeding the funding allocation estimated at 33,790. And I believe this is in front of uh, council this evening for signing of the transfer payment agreement. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. This is before council this evening as well as the bylaw. Uh, Could I have a motion to adjourn, please? Moved by Councillor Abdallah, seconded by Councillor Reeby. All those in favor? This meeting is now adjourned. Thank you.
I'd like to call this council meeting of Tuesday, the August the 10th, 2021 to order. Before opening this meeting of council, I would ask those who wish, each in your own way, silently join in a prayer of guidance over these proceedings. Thank you. Is there any disclosure of pecuniary interest and general nature thereof? Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, 6B, which is bylaw 2021 46, there's a perceived pecuniary interest. Thank you. Minutes approved for the minutes of our regular meeting of council, which was held on July the 13th, 2021. Moved by Councillor Abdallah, seconded by Councillor Plummer. All those in favor? Carried. Adopt the minutes from our committee, combined committee meeting, which was held on July the 13th, 2021. Moved by Councillor Reevy, seconded by the Deputy Mayor. All those in favor? Carried. Receiving the minutes from committees, Festival Hall, March the 18th, 2021. The Ottawa Valley Waste Management Board of March the 18th, 2021. And the Community Improvement Plan Panel Meeting held on April the 27th, 2021. Moved by Councillor Giacono, seconded by Councillor Lafreniere. All those in favor? Carried. Uh, combined committee proposal, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship. Your combined committee of council begs to report and recommend from its meeting held this evening as follows. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Reevy, the proposal number P21-01 for engineering services for the citywide risk assessment and storm outfall review be awarded to Aquafor Beach Limited in the amount of $307,870 plus HST and that the additional expenditures in the amount of $80,000 be approved for a contingency allowance. Total value of the recommendations equals $387,870 plus applicable HST. Thank you. Any comments? None. All those in favor? Carried. Um, bylaw, appoint bylaw enforcement officers, Councillor Abdallah. Thank you, Your Worship. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Andrew Plummer, that bylaw 2021 45, a bylaw to appoint municipal bylaw enforcement officers for the city of Pembroke be adopted and passed, and further, that the said bylaw be signed by the mayor and clerk and sealed with the seal of the corporation. Any comments? This is a standard housekeeping procedure. We periodically add or remove people to uh, administer the bylaws of the municipality. Thank you. All those in favor? Okay, carried. Transfer of easement, Councillor Reevy. Thank you, Your Worship. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Plummer. The bylaw 2021 46, a bylaw to provide for the transfer of land and granting of an easement for 576 <coughs> Melton Street in the city of Pembroke be adopted and passed, and further that the said bylaw be signed by the mayor and clerk and sealed with the seal of the corporation. Comments? None. All those in favor? Carried. Amend bylaw 2020 71, Councillor Plummer. Thank you, Your Worship. <clears throat> Move by myself, Secretary of Council Reevy, that bylaw 2021 47, a bylaw to amend bylaw 2020 71, being a bylaw to establish and regulate a fire department in the city of Pembroke, be adopted and passed, and then further that said bylaw be signed by the mayor and clerk and sealed with the seal of the corporation. Thank you. No comments. All those in favor? Okay, carried. The ICIP uh, COVID 19 Resilience Infrastructure Stream, Deputy Mayor. Your Worship, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Reevy, that bylaw 2021 48, a bylaw to enter into a transfer payment agreement between Her Majesty the Queen and the Rate of Ontario, as represented by the Minister of Infrastructure and the Corporation of the City of Pembroke for the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program, COVID-19 Resiliency Infrastructure Stream, local government intake be adopted and passed, and further that the said bylaw be signed by the Mayor and Clerk and sealed with the seal of the Corporation. Thank you. All those in favour? Carried. Resolution 2021-021, Councillor Plummer. Thank you, Your Worship. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Reevy. Whereas the City of Pembroke received on April 16, 2021, correspondence from the Town of Mono, and whereas the City and the Corporation, <coughs> sorry, the Council of the Corporation, the City of Pembroke supports the position of the Town of Mono regarding cannabis licensing and enforcement. 
Therefore, be resolved that a copy of this resolution be forwarded to Honourable Marie Claude Below, uh, Minister of Agriculture and Aggie Food, the Honourable Aaron uh, Hardman, Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, MP Cheryl Gallant, Renfrew Nipsing, Pembroke, MPP John Yakabuski, Renfrew Nipsing, uh, Pembroke, and Associated of Municipalities of Ontario. Thank you. Any comments? Questions? Okay, all those in favor? Carried. Resolution 2021-22, Support of Current Affordable Housing. Councillor Jackano. Your Worship, uh, I have to defer that I do not have that in front of me. Um, does somebody have it? Deputy Mayor, how about I give you my copy? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, moved by uh, Councillor Jackano and uh, seconded second. by myself. Whereas the City of Pembroke received on July 16, 2021, correspondence from the City of Woodstock as attached to uh, everyone's packages. And whereas the Council of the Corporation of the City of Pembroke supports the position of the City of Woodstock regarding the affordable housing crisis in Canada, therefore be it resolved that a copy of this resolution be forwarded to the Honourable Doug Ford, Premier of Ontario, the Minister sorry, Ministry of the Attorney General, the Honourable Christine Elliott, Minister of Health, the Honourable Steve Clark, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, the Honourable Merle Fullerton, Minister of Children and Community and Social Services, MP Cheryl Gallant of Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke, MPP John Yakabuski, Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke, and the Association of Municipalities of Ontario. Thank you. Do you have any comments, uh, Councillor Jackano? I do, Your Worship. Uh, everyone is aware of the uh, necessity for uh, social housing with uh, the province, not only uh, in the city of Toronto, Waterloo, or, or any other uh, larger cities like London, Ontario. Uh, the city of Pembroke as well, and county, uh, there can be uh, a large waiting list uh, for supportive, affordable housing within our, uh, within our communities. Part of that is being driven by uh, the sale of houses, as we mentioned before, within the area where real, real estate prices have skyrocketed. Uh, landlords are uh, looking to sell their properties to get the maximum number of dollars, thus displacing individuals who may have had a uh, certain stability in living within, a, within that home or that apartment for a number of years. So uh, there has to be some changes. Uh, I know that there is a large influx of housing taking place within our community, homes that are being built, but there has to be uh, some sort of uh, perhaps some correspondence between the County of Renfrew and contractors to see if there can be any affordable housing uh, incorporated into, uh, into any of these projects that are taking place. Thank you. Thank you. All those in favor? Carried. The CIP, uh, uh, resolution 2021-023, Councillor Reedy. Thank you, Your Worship. Moved by myself, seconded by Deputy Mayor Gervais. Be it resolved that the Corporation of the City of Pembroke approves the application from 577785 Ontario Limited at 10 Pembroke Street West under the Community Improvement Plan. The applicant must comply with grant guidelines of the Downtown Heritage Facade Improvement Grant and Accessibility Grant and must complete all work and submit receipts within 18 months of this approval in order to receive the grant. The grant total awarded to this applicant is $7,500. Thank you. All those in favour? Carried. Resolution 2021-024, Councillor Lafreniere. Moved by myself, second by Council Reedy, be it resolved that the Corporation of the City of Pembroke approves the application from 188852 Ontario Inc. at 159 Pembroke Street West under the Community Improvement Plan. The applicant must comply with grant guidelines of the Downtown Heritage Facade Improvement Grant, Planning and Building Permit Fee Grant, and Accessibility Grant and must complete all work and submit receipts within 18 months of this approval in order to receive the grant. The grant total awarded to this applicant is $6,329.63. Thank you. All those in favor? Carried. 
Uh, Councillor Jackano, Resolution 2021-025. Do you have it? Your Worship, I will have to defer that one to you as a great deal of the discussion in regards to this took place at uh, a meeting that I could not technically access uh, last evening. So, Your Worship, would you mind? No, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Moved by Councillor Jack and second by Councillor Reavy. Whereas the Federation of the Canadian Municipalities, which is FCM and ICLEI Local Governments for Sustainability, which is ICLEI Canada, have established the Partners for Climate Protection five milestone <coughs> program to assist municipal governments in developing a strategy for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Whereas the PCP program five milestone framework involves competing, sorry, completing a GHG inventory and forecast, setting a GHG reduction target, developing a local climate action plan, implementing the plan and monitoring progress and reporting results. Whereas the PCP program provides a forum for municipal governments to share their knowledge and experience with other municipal governments on how to reduce GHG emissions. Whereas over 450 municipal governments across Canada have already committed to reducing corporate and community GHG emissions through the PCP program since inception in 1994. Therefore, be it resolved that the municipal sorry, municipality of the City of Pembroke review the guidelines on the PCP member benefits and responsibilities and then communicate to FCM and ICLEI Canada its participation in the PCP program and its commitment to achieving the milestones set out in the PCP five milestone framework. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, just to update you, th this was the presentation we had when we had that horrible storm in July. We had the people from the Federation of Municipalities, Canadian Municipalities, and we also had the presentation uh, uh, from Anne, uh, a member of the committee. Uh, just, just to uh, explain, I'll, I'll read very shortly, just, just basically what we're speaking of. Well, first of all, uh, I, I want Council to know that we, are, we have joined the Federation of uh, Canadian Municipalities. We were not part of that. We were always part of AMO. Uh, but uh, I think we realize more and more over the last couple of years that pretty well all the funding from the federal government tends to go through the Federation of Municipalities and then to AMO. This way here, as an example, we're talking about transportation, we're talking about other issues where we're, we're if you wish, getting rid of the middleman. So we're going directly to uh, the Federation of uh, Canadian Municipalities. So we've joined that. But here's just uh, a, a few comments. The Climate Action Advisory Committee believes that the Partners for Climate Protection which is the PCB five milestone framework provides the necessary structure and support to guide the city through this process. Therefore, the climate committee is recommending to the city that we use this particular program. We're not reinventing the wallet. Uh, the PCB program is managed and delivered by the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and the local governments for St sustainability Canada and receives financial support from the government of Canada and also the ICLEI. So just to give you some, some background. Um, all those in favor? Okay, carried. Thank you. Mayor's report. On Saturday afternoon, I welcomed uh, Chief Vern Janvier and the Walkers from the Chippewayan Prairie First Nation Band in Alberta. They were staying at the, the uh, Best Western as they were coming down from Sudbury and should arrive in, in, uh, going on their way to Ottawa. The goals of their blinding light walk are were threefold. One, to create awareness of what occurred to the children in residential schools. Two, to bring awareness of the injustice that continues under the Indian Act for Indigenous people. And three, reconciliation to make Canada a healthy place where everyone is equal. And they hope, well, they will arrive in Ottawa on Friday and they'll be meeting government officials at that time. A brief update on the progress of gathering information for Council on the Margaret Duville mural. 
I have just completed speaking with all the principals in regards to the ongoing review of the mural. And as I said earlier, it is crucial for us to be respectful of the concerns raised. And I am now in the process of putting a report together for council to review at our September the 7th council meeting. Last Thursday, the mayors had a meeting with Dr. Cushman and staff. The positive news is that over 81% of eligible Renfrew County and city residents have had one shot and 75% have had two shots. However, there is still a real concern, especially since the Delta variant is so contagious. <laughs> Dr. Cushman describes it as a pandemic of the unvaccinated. There are still approximately 17,000 eligible people who have not yet been vaccinated or received the first shot. The majority of the unvaccinated are between the ages of 12 and 18, and also those in the 40 to 45 range. These vaccines are safe and are protection against COVID. If you have a friend that is hesitant about being vaccinated, please encourage them to contact the Renfrew County District Health Unit. Once again, I want to thank our frontline workers and our local business community who continue to adapt their operations to serve us and help our community stay safe. Thank you staff and volunteers who continue to work tirelessly at the vaccine clinics throughout the county. Thank you Pembroke City staff for continuing to provide activities for all our residents. It has not been easy with COVID-19 restrictions and council and our community appreciate the extra work you are doing in providing ongoing safe activities for our community. Finally, please, if you are one of the 17,000 eligible people who have not yet been vaccinated, get that first shot as soon as possible. And please, everyone, stay safe. I'll be attending the Association of Municipalities of Ontario virtual conference next week, and I'll be participating in delegation meetings with various ministers with the Eastern Ontario Mayor's Caucus and I'll provide a council, uh, a full report for council of the highlights of the conference at the end of next week. Uh, any notices of motion? Councillor Adala. <coughs> Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, notice of motion at the next meeting, I'll be making a motion seconded by Deputy Mayor Ron Gervais to reconsider the integration of a waterfront development plan with the $80,000 active living master plan. Thank you. Council updates. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Since our last council meeting, the P uh, Pembroke Police Services Board had its regular meeting. In addition to getting our regular quarterly report from the inspector, the board received a, a special presentation from the co-chairs of the Diversity Advisory Committee. Uh, the presentation was followed by comments from the inspector and from the staff sergeant. Uh, some of the key points that uh, I want to make known to this uh, committee and to the public at large is different comments that the inspector and staff sergeant made, such as that diversity is a journey, but it is not a destination and that it will take some, some time to get there. Uh, stereotypes break down when conversations happen. It was very interesting to hear from the inspector and staff sergeant in terms of the OPP as to uh, the officer training, uh, including de-escalation training, conflict resolution, annual training, that it has a hate crimes unit in addition to all the other units that we're aware of, including the SAVE team, uh, that it has a mental health unit, and that our own detachment is classified as a safe place uh, for individuals. Um, Long story short, uh, if I can say it, that uh, I was very pleased uh, with the uh, presentation from the Diversity Committee and the, and the response that came from our OPP, uh, being the inspector and the staff sergeant. Um, I would encourage uh, the, that particular committee, in particular the, the, uh, the uh, two co-chairs, that they also make presentations to other organizations and boards, including the hospital and so forth. The OPP are not the only organization uh, that they should make uh, themselves aware uh, or present themselves to that, uh, that there is now a diversity advisory committee. Thank, Thank you. you. Councillor Abdallah. Thank you, Your Worship. Just have a few updates. Two weeks ago, I attended the uh, sod turning ceremony at CNL. Chalk, Chalk River Nuclear Laboratories of their new science collaboration center 
And uh, it was 17 years since I left ACL from the IT department to become a teacher. And I was amazed at the changes that have gone on up there. And uh, Warden Debbie Robinson reminded everyone of the over $500 million payroll that ACL contributes to our economy, over $45 million in purchases. They're building a smart campus. It's the third building they're using. Uh, using mass timber products and I'm very impressed with their commitment to sustainability and Councillor Giacono have, uh, and I have talked about this for the new aquatic complex. This is something that we can uh, look at in building the new pool and obtain up to five million dollars in government grants for sustainable buildings and green buildings. Um, things are happening at Atomic Energy at, at CNL. It's very exciting. And I was really proud to represent the city of Pembroke, and they're a major partner in uh, jobs and future future uh, businesses coming out of their smart campus. Uh, on Saturday, we had a destination event in Pembroke. Uh, my wife and I volunteered at the uh, Rivertown Saints concert at the uh, soccer field at Riverside Park, and I wanted. It was such a great event. Uh, there was over 200 cars there. Nothing but positive comments. Uh, visitors from all over Ontario came. There was even a, a group of women fans of the band that came from Hamilton. Uh, I want to give uh, kudos to Ron Conroy, the manager of Parks and Recreation, Sarah Fredericks, the programmer, and staff for preparing the facility, and uh, those that worked that day. Um, Councillor Lafreniere and I are going to meet with uh, Mr. Conroy and Ms. Frederick and also the Recreation Advisory Committee to discuss next year's plans. These destination events are very important for a community um, and they put Pembroke on the map and we have to expand this or do something similar next year and maybe expand it with the Midway, etc. I also want to uh, thank the Pembroke Firefighters Professional Association for the fireworks show that everyone saw. That was wonderful too. So it was a great day with the concert and topped off with the fireworks. Um, this Saturday, I'm on an organizing committee with Randy Peterson and Tanner Hogan, the owners of the Colony Skateboard Shop. Uh, the city is a major sponsor in uh, the heavy metal skateboard event. It starts at noon with a barbecue, free registration, and there's three categories for junior and then uh, men's and ladies competition. It's great to be having uh, events down at the skateboard park again. We're planning a Halloween event also. And this is an excellent use of the programming and partnership money we have through Parks and Recreation. So, so it's great to see things going on in the City of Pembroke. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Reedy. Thank you, Your Worship. The Diversity Advisory Committee met yesterday, and um, so we've established a date for our town hall. It's going to be a Wednesday evening, September 22nd. We wanted to wait until we could actually have people in attendance, so we felt comfortable with that date. Um, so there are going to be a lot of stakeholders invited to participate, um, as well as community members. So we. The purpose is to share the findings of the survey that went out uh, two months ago and to answer questions um, and give us uh, somewhere to to go forward with uh, with hopefully developing a, um, a diversity plan. Uh, Festival Hall Consortium just recently met as well. Uh, Rick is getting excited to reopen and to bring live performances back to Pembroke. So hoping everybody will uh, will support um, him and get out to the hall and enjoy some uh, some performances that we've not been able to, to do in far too long. The other thing coming out of the Festival Hall is um, Consortium is looking at replacing all the seats. This is an ongoing project, but we're pretty confident um, that we'll be soon moving forward forward with that. Uh, really hoping on getting some grant money. Um, so that is news that we're waiting for. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, yes, Councillor Lafreniere. Yes, thank you. Um, 
because of the lessening restrictions for the COVID protocol, the Seniors Advisory Committee met on July 21st again after a brief break due to not being able to meet in person and some of our members not having access to Zoom. Um, lots of discussion, um, primarily around recommendations that will be coming to this council uh, during budget deliberations, uh, as well as some discussion with um, Mr. Conroy from the Recreation Department on how we could access a grant writer um, service uh, because there is so there is money out there to do what we need to do uh, beginning with the survey that we completed and analyzing it to see what our priority would be out of that survey. Um, we don't have the uh, we don't have access to a full-time grant writer, so there, there was a great idea come up and the recommendation will be coming to this council, as well as a recommendation for another seasonal concert coming up in Christmas. So look forward to those reports. They'll be coming soon. Thank you. Thank you. A council and caucus meeting was held earlier to discuss personal matters about an identifiable individual including municipal or local board employees. There were no pecuniary interests declared and there's nothing to report from the meeting. Confirming bylaw, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Worship Uboy, myself, seconded by Councillor Abdallah, the bylaw 14-2021 to confirm the proceedings of the regular meeting of Council of August 10th, 2021 be adopted and passed and further that said bylaw be signed by the Mayor and Clerk and sealed with the seal of the Corporation. Thank you, all those in favor. Carried. Could I have a motion to adjourn, please? Moved by Councillor Reeve, seconded by Councillor Abdallah. All those in favor? We are now adjourned. Thank you very much.